Good morning, everybody. I'll call to order the regular meeting of the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission. It is Thursday, December 7th, 2023 at 9.03 a.m. Clerk, will you please call the roll? Commissioner Peterson? Here. Commissioner Sandy Brown? Here. Here. Commissioner Johnson? Here. Commissioner Montesino? Here. Commissioner Hernandez? Present. Commission Alternate Schifrin? Commissioner Alternate Quinn? Here. Commissioner Koenig? Here. Commissioner McPherson? Commissioner Kristen Brown? Here. Commission Alternate Pegler? Here. And Commission Alternate Kalantari Johnson? And uh, uh, Randy, Wright, Randy Ryder? Here. All right. We have a quorum. Uh, and since everyone's here, I guess we don't have any 2449 requests. So moving on, do we have any additions or deletions to the consent or regular agendas today? Uh, I believe your mic is to be turned on. On, but apparently not. There you go. This is much better. Yes. Um, there was a uh, revised agenda that was posted on the um, on the commission website that added item 35. Uh, we also have uh, a handout for item 21 that was posted. And there was a revised staff report for item 25 and a handout for item 25 that were posted. And you also have in front of you a handout, an additional handout for item 25 that, that, that looks like this. It should be seen there in front of you. And those are all the added things. Great, thank you. Now proceed with oral communications. To see so many of you here this morning. Any member of the public may address the commission on any item within the jurisdiction yeah. of the commission that is not already on the agenda. The commission will listen to all communication, but compliance with state law may not take action on items that are not on the agenda. Speakers are requested to state their name clearly so that it can be accurately recorded in the minutes of the meeting. Uh, and if you do have, if you, we'll take comment on items that uh, are on the agenda as well if you cannot stay for those items later. If anyone wish to speak? Yes, please approach the podium. Brandon, if you could just check your mic as well. <laughs> Metro phase one. There'll be an item for you to vote on today to make sure that they keep their jobs and that we double this. We are here to show you that we are not asking for faith. We are here to prove to you we will get the job done. We are getting the job done. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Freeman. Anyone else wish to address the commission? Hello, uh, my name is Jordan Vesconis. I'm a representative of the admin staff at Santa Cruz Metro. And I just wanted to come up here to, to tell, every, tell every the public that uh, this is a very common sense vote for constituents and voters. Um, we have a lot to offer in this package, and this is the most critical time for Metro to show you what we can do. And we've already done so much work to prepare for this. And now that we're so close to the finish line to get started, we just need that final little push with that grant money. And with all the fun, exciting new you know products and features that we're adding to our service, I think the constituents would be extremely happy with how this goes, assuming this vote passes. Thank you. Mr. Vasconis. Anyone else wish to address us here that's in the audience? Hello, good morning, board. It's good to see you all again. Um, James Sandoval here, International Vice President of Smart Transportation Division, which is the union that represents all these operators. I just wanna make it real quick. We have all the pieces to the puzzle to make it happen. Public transit's needed a lot of work for a long time. And we're just about there. So we need you all to help us get across that finish line. So thank you. Thank you. All right, seeing no one else. If, if you do wish to address us, if you could uh, generally get in the area of the podium so that you're ready to speak. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Chair Koenig and Commissioners Jim Helmer, Ben Lomond. For years, California communities that have a state highway serving as their main street had been subject to posted speed limits much higher than those on neighboring local streets. That has been and still is the case in Ben Lomond, posted at 25 miles per hour up until the 1990s. 
the speed limit on State Highway 9 was raised to 30 after the traffic signal at Mill Street was installed. The reason? Speeds increased. And by statute, Caltrans had to raise the limit through a process called a engineering speed survey using radar. The law changed in October 2021 when Governor Newsom signed into law AB 43 titled quite clearly traffic safety bill. Caltrans without performing surveys can return the speed limit to 25 miles as it is per hour as it is in Boulder Creek and Felton. <clears throat> Speeds are higher in Ben Loman even with its sweeping S curves at each end of the business district where I might add both of the 30 mile per hour speed signs have been hit head on by errant drivers on multiple occasions. The law now reads, this is the law now, the prima facie speed limit of 25 miles per hour on state highways located in any business or residence district and would authorize the Department of Transportation, Caltrans, to change the speed limit on any such highway as prescribed, including erecting signs to give notice thereof. Let's get proactive. Let's slow down the traffic on Highway 9. And I am in communications with Caltrans District 5 on this. Thank you, Mr. Helmer. Right, if there's no one else here in the audience which to address us, is there anyone online? Harry? Mute. Uh, I have a presentation. Did that pop up? And if not, I'll just have to speak without it. It did not. Okay, then I am going to talk about the futility of pursuing a trail next to the tracks. If you look at the design, it has miles of retaining walls for the seven miles of actual new trail in sections eight through 11. That's from the boardwalk to State Park Drive. And when I say miles, it, we're talking about seven miles of trail and four miles of retaining walls. But first, let me get to when a trail costs more than a freeway lane, something is very wrong. You need to know that it's costing 21 million per mile. That comes from the CTC. It, it, uh, it costs more than double a, a highway freeway lane, which is 10 to 12 million per mile. Um, the Smart Rail Trail, up in Marin County is 2.7 million per mile, and that's for 21 miles. And all it does is it depletes the fund for uh, doing any trails beyond that. Now I'd like to get to the issue of global warming. The trail, the railroad, keeping the tracks there requires the trail to be massive, it requires massive excavation. As I said, four miles of retaining walls, 15 feet into the hillside is where you excavate. So that leads to 22,000 tons of global warming CO2. That's equivalent to 160 car miles. It would take a train 28 years to run just to counter those seven miles of CO2. And knowing that there's much more of the three times of the trail that has similar difficult terrain, it'll be around 100 plus years to run a train to counter the CO2. That means Considering that 2060 is the earliest for a commuter train, according to the EIR for its segments nine, uh, 10 and 11, uh, that would put our commuter train having to run for until 2160, that's 140 years from now, before we even start to reduce carbon. That defeats the 2050 zero emission 1.5 deadline of the Paris Agreement. And basically what I'm saying is rec it's reckless spending and it leads to global warming, even with a train. So you guys just need to give up on this, this pushing for something. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Pico. Johanna Lighthill. Good morning, commissioners. Thanks for considering comments this morning. Uh, it was just over 10 years ago when the RTC invited the public to, to workshops to share what they envisioned for the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail. I think you know how it went. Everybody wanted a wide, safe trail, uh, separated from cars, kids could ride to school, beautiful path through nature, um, everything in the, and, uh, and more, of course. 
uh, there was some excitement then. The master plan was created, but it was conceptual. And trail designs were to be developed over time on a segment by segment basis. And over the past 10 years, the community has been assured that both rail and trail will fit within the corridor. The public believed this last year when Measure D was defeated. Why would anyone opt for just a trail when we can have both rail and trail? And this is still the understanding today. Today, I asked the commission to shift its focus away from the noise of the rail versus trail debate and evaluate on what type of trail is really possible. It's pretty different from the one envisioned. As you just heard from Dr. Pico, there are some significant environmental consequences. Um, you know, tree removal, retaining walls, etc. Yet despite these improvements, excuse me, yes, yet despite these improvements, even with the realignment of the tracks, we still can't get a trail wide enough that would provide a safe active transportation through our community. Federal and state plan trail planning guides recommend wider paths for safety and explain that paths of the width of the ultimate trail on, on a path that width, significant user conflict is to be expected. Even the rail concept report consultants have hinted about trouble ahead. Their proposal says that uh, the trail might need to be redesigned and um, possibly reconstructed. So I hope that you'll take this into consideration um, in the next few months. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Ms. Lighthill. Brett Garrett. Good morning. I am Brett Garrett from Santa Cruz, a longtime advocate for personal rapid transit, PRT. Last week, I attended the Podcar City Conference in San Jose, all about PRT and similar technologies. The mayor of San Jose talked about the PRT system that is coming soon to connect Diridon Station to the airport in San Jose. Contra Costa County is also making great progress toward its own 28-mile PRT system. And I got to sit in an actual PRT pod car in San Jose, all of which renewed my commitment to do what I can to help Santa Cruz County make the best possible decisions regarding transit options from Watsonville to Santa Cruz. We can and should do better than conventional rail. One problem with rail is that it's constrained to only the rail corridor. I keep hearing that half of the population in the county is within one mile of the corridor, but that statement needs more context. How many are within one mile walking distance? How many are within a quarter mile walking distance? How will conventional rail serve Cabrillo College or downtown Santa Cruz when it takes 15 minutes to walk from these destinations to the rail corridor? Um, PRT could bridge that gap by serving beyond the rail corridor with direct on-demand efficient transportation. And even if the system is restricted to the railroad corridor, PRT can, can still leave the tracks in place and work better than a conventional train because PRT provides on-demand nonstop service. I am very grateful that Metro is planning free service with 15 minute intervals. That's a big improvement and uh, conventional rail probably cannot do that here, but PRT could actually do better with on-demand service that gets you to your destination faster. The TCAA gave very misleading results with respect to PRT. I suggest doing what San Jose did, issuing an RFP or RFI for innovative solutions, saying here's what we need, here's what we can pay. They got realistic in information, and it looks like they're building it. We can do the same here. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Garrett. Mr. Michael Saint. Uh, good morning, Chair Koenig, Commissioners, Michael Saint with CFST and Aptos resident. I too attended the Podcar uh, conference uh, with Brett, uh, Garrett, Joe Jordan, and my wife Elizabeth. For this was for me an exploratory venture into another mass transportation possibility for Santa Cruz County. My goal was to learn about costs, funding, and actually what this Podcar system could do in regards to passenger movement on an hourly basis and its ability to relieve congestion on Highway 1. One thing I thought was cool about PodCar or PRT system is passengers have no need to know what the schedule is, what line to catch or transfers to make. You just need to know your destination. 
This would be easy for our uh, citizens to do, especially for the elderly people, this would work very well. The cost to build uh, widely varied from 10 million a mile to 50 million a mile, depending on topography of the corridor, land use issues and jurisdictions involved and pod car size. The funding issues seem to have been solved by the use of a 3P scenario, which means public private participation with investors taking most of the risk with hopes that they will get a return on their investment. No grant money is required. But it would be beneficial if some grants could happen, and they did mention the Justice 40 initiative for disadvantaged communities as a possibility. The thing that I most enthused about was the PRT pod car system is that the cost of operation and maintenance of the system is covered by the fare box, and investors may see a 5% plus weight return on their investment, meaning no tax measures after system up and running, or looking for subsidies to keep the system viable and running for years. It sounds almost too good to be true. The PR system can be up and running in five years. The CEO of Glideway said the Deardon to San Jose Airport project will be running in 2028. Thank you for your time and allowing me to speak. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Saint. Zen Sawyer. Good morning, uh, Chair Koenig and the board. Uh, thank you for allowing me the time to speak today. Um, my name is Zen Sawyer. I'm uh, the president of Zen Development. Uh, we're an affordable housing developer uh, and I'm partnered with Link Housing, who's one of the larger nonprofit affording affordable developers in the state. They have about 9,000 units statewide. And we're working on a site of which we have site control at 41st and SoCal. Um, it's a, it's a, two and a half acre site. It's what I would describe as a marquee development. So we're looking at uh, about 150 uh, units on the site. Um, and there's one time uh, funding out there right now from the state uh, called CDBG DR for disaster recovery. That's a result of the 2020 fires in Santa Cruz. The county has $40 million available to reconstruct affordable housing and if we don't use that, then it's going to go into a statewide pool and the county is going to lose that opportunity. Uh, otherwise, the county does not have a lot of funds to build affordable housing. Uh, and how this relates to the discussion this morning is that uh, my understanding is there's going to be a vote on whether to fully fund phase two of the re reimagined metro uh, operating funds to increase services to um, uh, about 15 minutes uh, peak headway on the bus lines along SoCal. Uh, and in order for us to get the density we need to develop this site, we really need uh, that phase two to be funded in order for us to qualify for uh, 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 increased density uh, so that a, a transit stop there can qualify as a major transit stop with 15 minute peak headway of two lines or more. Uh, that's what's going to allow us to get to 150 units and bring about $120 million uh, total development cost project to the local economy. So I'd like you to uh, consider that in your decision this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Sawyer. Mr. Brian Peoples. Hi, this is uh, Brian Peoples with Trail Now. First, I want to thank uh, Dr. Kerry Pico for his outstanding work to continue to educate us about the cost of building this elevated trail next to the tracks and the environmental destruction that will occur when you do that. Um, and when you're building a, a 12 foot wide trail that costs three times as much as widening Highway 1, we know we have a problem. I also like to thank Brett and uh, Michael Saint about talking about realistic alternatives, rubber wheels on asphalt. That's what that PRT is all about. And so for our organiz our community to continue with this plan to build an expensive substandard trail next to the tracks, when we've been educated by former RTC executive director, Guy Preston, that the fastest way to bu build the trail, the most eco-friendly way to build the trail, and the uh, is to rail bank, pull the rails, recycle those rails and ties, and build a trail. Um, now, this two weeks ago, there was another accident on Harbor Bridge, Murray Street, 
And um, this accident should not have occurred. There have been a lot of deaths and injuries. And if the trail had existed as proposed by Guy Preston years ago, we won't be having these accidents. So we're asking you to please prioritize opening the coastal trail as a transportation resource, which means rail banking that corridor. It's very critical for our community and we need to stop people getting injured. Harbor Bridge is a very dangerous pass and we can open that corridor today if we move forward with rail banking. I appreciate your time, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Peoples. Mr. Lowell Hurst. Uh, good morning, commissioners, and uh, I'm glad to see our South County folks could uh, make it up to Scotts Valley today. You know, that that can be quite a slog. It's, it's pretty congested at times. So I'll make my uh, comments very brief today. I think that, uh, you know, as a South County resident, I just want to support Metro all I can. I see the need with the elderly, with um, young folks that can't drive and those that can't drive at all. I also want to support the trail. There's lots of uh, people who want to use the trail and lots of access that needs to be opened up along the trail. But let's also not forget about the importance of rail and the possibilities of rail. So while you're doing the freeway, and I think the freeway is really important and the county roads and all, uh, and all, let's support Metro, the trail, the rail, and the freeway and the roads. And hey, let's get us moving, okay? That's it for me, thanks. Thank you, Mr. Hurst. Jean Brocklebank. Good morning, commissioners. Um, I hope, well, you are all aware of that horrific crash on the Murray Street Bridge about 10 days ago, wherein an unconscious drunk driver plowed into a couple, a husband and wife, who were walking on the narrow bridge sidewalk, striking the wife and resulting in the husband throwing himself into what he thought would be harbor water, but landed instead on a concrete abutment. Both sustained serious injuries. My husband and I walk across the Murray Street Bridge at least two or three times a week, and we were concerned that people might have thought that we were that husband and wife because they see us walking a lot. Um, I'm asking that the RTC seriously consider prioritizing the building of segment of the segment nine optional first phase of the ultimate trail on the train trestle over the harbor as soon as possible before any other segment nine construction. I'm asking the RTC to agendize this for its January meeting so you may discuss this and vote on it. Um, we always walk defensively because we see vehicles speeding across the bridge, drivers cutting into the bike lanes, driving distracted by their cell phones and their impatience. Please do whatever the RTC may be able to do to prioritize converting the rail trestle for an interim, interim trail only uh, and prioritize doing that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Brocklebank. Jack Nelson. Yes, good morning, commissioners uh, and staff and members of the public. I'm Jack Nelson. I'm a retired land use planner and environmental planner. And I first learned about the functioning of Earth's, uh, I'll call them natural systems that operate around our, our wonderful globe that we live on. Uh, when I was an environmental st studies student in the late 1980s at UC Santa Cruz. <clears throat> this morning, I have an email from somebody on a, a climate news email list I'm on pointing out a new study uh, that was published by the European Geosciences Union in their publication, Earth System Dynamics, uh, where they're working on models of our future climate outcomes uh, based on Earth's natural systems, especially looking at glacial and interglacial cycles. This study concludes that just the greenhouse gases that humanity has put into the atmosphere so far 
have the potential to leave the Northern Hemisphere ice-free for hundreds of thousands of years into the future. That's the direction we're heading. We are uh, changing Earth's climate, not just till something like the end of this century, which is often discussed, but essentially uh, for human uh, conception forever. So how does that relate to the RTC? Well, you make decisions about whether we're going to keep driving fossil fuel burning cars as our dominant system of transportation or whether we're going to have more alternatives. I'm asking you, of course, to feed the alternatives and help us have a better future than what this study suggests could happen. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. And our last speaker, Barry Scott. Good morning, uh, commissioners, and thank you, Chair Koenig, for permitting uh, us to speak if we need to to an item on the agenda. Um, I wanted to first uh, thank uh, Mayor Hurst and James Sandoval for their comments. Uh, the the uh, the agenda item later today, uh, staff, the revised staff recommendation for expenditures, um, it makes me very happy to see Metro get um, practically all the funding they need to really launch their, their robust improvements. Uh, it's just so exciting. I'm grateful for the, uh, the restoration of $2 million in funding toward the rail transit concept study, which I understand already has close to $10 million in funding and still has a about a $16 million need, um, and I'm not too worried about that. I, I want to share something that came out of TAMC's meeting yesterday. They uh, made a commitment to take their SB 125 funds and split them evenly between the MST, their bus transit, and uh, TAMC's rail programs uh, to the tune of a little more than $25 million each. Uh, and so with the... Uh, funding of Metro this cycle, I look forward to robust funding to, to match TAMC's effort next uh, uh, this, this coming year and, and in future years, because we are a region after all. Finally, uh, 2060 was cited by an earlier commenter as the year that rail would begin. No, that is the year if we do an interim trail, the rail project would be put off until 2060. So you know, the details are very important. So uh, anyway, I thank you. Have a great day. Goodbye. Thank you, Mr. Scott. We do not have any other speakers. Mr. McPherson. I, I, I would just like to um, say while our drivers and much of our staff are here that um, I really want to say thank you. I think I know our whole board does for uh, your acceptance and, th and enthusiasm to implementing our 15 minute headway. This is the most ambitious program that we've had in Metro in my 11 years, uh, this board. So I thank you for your support. I know you're enthused about it. We're gonna give better service to more people in Santa Cruz County. Thank you for your support. You're here. Um, all right, well, let's uh, proceed so that we can get to our presentation from Santa Cruz Metropolitan Transit District, item 24 in the public hearing at 945. Um, so now we'll proceed with the consent agenda. Any commissioner have comments or questions on the consent agenda? Seeing none. Uh, any uh, public comment on the consent agenda? All right, then I'll return to the commission for action. Second. Motion by Commissioner Schifrin, second by Commissioner Montesino. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? That motion passes unanimously. We will now proceed with item 20, commissioner reports. Commissioner have uh, anything you'd like to share? I would. Oh, okay, Commissioner Johnson. Uh, just um, on behalf of the uh, city of Scotts Valley, uh, our city council, uh, just wanna welcome everybody to our great city. Um, as you can tell, a lot has been happening over the years. Um, I think from where we were 10 or 15 years ago to where we are now, I'm pleased with things that are going on and benefits that the RTC has given Scotts Valley. So again, I just wanted to welcome you. Commissioner Johnson. 
All right, seeing uh, no other commissioner, we'll proceed with item 21, which is the selection of chair for uh, the year 2024. I will report that the chair selection committee consisting of myself, Commissioner Sandy Brown, McPherson, and uh, Mike Rotkin did meet and voted unanimously to nominate our current chair, our, our current vice chair, Kristen Brown, to be our chair for next year. <laughs> it, yes. <it's>, yeah. <laughs> Two more years. <laughs> and, uh, and for Commissioner Felipe Hernandez to be our new vice chair. for So... All right, we have a motion from Commissioner Schiffer and second from Commissioner Pegler. Is there any uh, public comment on this item? All right, seeing none, I'll turn to the motion uh, on the floor. This was, uh, this was, I raised my hand. Oh, Mr. Peoples, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. This is Brian Peoples trail now. You know, I first got involved with this organization over 25 years ago. Trail now was formed over a decade ago. And the reason was because we believe in transportation because it makes our community better. We actually were a political action committee supporting 2016 Measure D, and we all know what a phenomenal activity. Mr. Peoples, that. I hope there's something regarding our chair selection in your comment. Yeah, yes, I do. Thank you. I'll shorten it. In the item number 21, you see our comments about the importance of this chair position and the importance that this chair position person supports active transportation in opening the coastal corridor as fast as possible. Our expectation is that the Capitola trestle would be open and that that chairperson would support that. So we're hopeful that we continue to go down that pathway because it makes sense. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Peoples. All right, I'll return to the, uh, we have one more comment from Michael Saint. Michael Saint. Mr. Saint, did you wish to go yeah. on chair selection? Yeah. Thank you, Chair Koenig, uh, commissioners. I just wanted to congratulate uh, Kristen as well as Felipe on those positions. I think they'll do a wonderful job. They've been around for a long time and have quite a bit of experience and experiences on board situations. And especially like to thank uh, Manu Koenig. I think you did a wonderful and a very good job this year as chair. Um, it was not really surprising. I knew you when, you when you were an advocate and worked for Greenway, although I don't agree with some, a lot of those views. Uh, you were also very professional uh, in that manner as well. So thank you all your your hard work this year. It, it really looked like you made a big effort and, and did a great job. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Saint. If there's no other comments, I'll turn it to, well, yes. Yes, sir. On a, um... I just kind of want to echo that. I don't think anybody does uh, runs a better meeting than Manu. Um, he's professional, prepared. I just want to, uh, to thank you for a year's worth of uh, solid meeting. Mr. Johnson. Mr. Hernandez. I'd like to also echo some of those comments. You know, I think that uh, you represent a, a board and you chair a board, I think, what you've done is is incredible that you just managed to stay fair and neutral on all sides. So thank you for your professional uh, courtesies, your professional mannerism in running this board, the RTC board. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, confident that both of you will serve as excellent uh, chair and vice chair in the coming year. All right, if there's no other comments, um, will we have a motion for uh, our 2024 chair to be Commissioner Kristen Brown and our vice chair to be Commissioner Felipe Hernandez. All those in favor, say aye. Uh, aye. Any yeah. opposed? Any abstentions? That passes unanimously. And I look forward to handing you the gavel uh, in 2024. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, we'll proceed with the director's report. Uh, Mr. Louis, uh, Luis Mendez, our interim executive director. <laughs> Yes, uh, good morning, Mr. Chair and, and Commissioners. Uh, first, I want to say th thank you very much, uh, Chair Koenig, for your uh, great service to the Transportation Commission as chair during this uh, uh, 2023 year. You know that uh, you, you all, Commissioners, are, are very busy with a variety of, of various uh, tasks and boards you serve on and so on. So having you, you know, dedicate your time to also serve on the Transportation Commission is extremely helpful. Uh, to the work we do and, and, and to do it in such a professional way, it's 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 great. Th thank you very much for your work. Um, 
Also, I want to congratulate uh, uh, Commissioner Brown. Uh, we all on staff look forward to working with you as our new, as our new chair. Um, and also uh, Commissioner Hernandez, uh, we also look, work, look forward to working with you as our new vice chair. I'm sure you, you both will do great work. Um, I also want to um, provide a bit of information on what's happening on the construction on, on Highway 1. Uh, Caltrans did send out press release informing everyone that there will be overnight closures on Highway 1 at, uh, at 41st uh, Avenue on December 11th and 12th. And uh, that closure will last from 10 p.m. to 4.30 a.m. And it will be necessary to construct the working platform from which the new bicycle and pedestrian bridge at Chanticleer Avenue will, will be constructed. One lane in the southbound direction may also be closed from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. There will be a detour to Soquel Drive during the closure. And as always, uh, RTC staff, Caltrans, and, and all of us uh, encourage motorists and advise motorists to be extra alert and drive extra cautiously through the work zone. Also on Tuesday, December 5th, the RTC hosted an open house to receive community input on aesthetic design elements for the Highway 1 auxiliary lanes and bus on shoulder project from State Park Drive to Freedom Boulevard, along with the segment 12 of the Coastal Rail Trail project. Uh, this project does contain a number of highway and rail trail infrastructure assets that are being considered for aesthetic, aesthetic elements. Uh, approximately 70 people attended the open house and provided their input on the proposed aesthetic treatments, and we appreciate everyone for their attendance. For those who were not able to attend, the open house, there's still an opportunity to provide input on the aesthetic design elements for the project. The RTC has released a video presentation that details the aesthetic elements being considered in an online survey for community members to provide their input. Links to the video presentation and online survey are on the RTC's website, and the survey will be available through the end of December. And also uh, uh, news from uh, the California Transportation Commission. Uh, Senate Bill SB1 cycle for um, uh, grant process will be kicked off um, um, on December 14th with a uh, workshop on the uh, on the guidelines that the CTC has announced. If you recall, in 2022, the RTC submitted an application for auxiliary lanes and bus and shoulder on Highway 1 between State Park Drive and Freedom Boulevard, along with Segment 12 of the Coastal Rail Trail. It also included bicycle, pedestrian, signal, and transit improvements on Soquel Drive, transit improvements in Watsonville, and electric bus purchases. The application was highly ranked, but did not receive funding because the environmental document for the auxiliary lanes project was not yet completed. The env environmental document will be completed by the time the applications are due. Uh, so staff does plan to submit the application again and um, is, and, and staff will be participating at that kickoff workshop on December 14th to make sure that your staff is adequately prepared to, to submit the most competitive application possible for that project. And, all, and you may recall that staff's also been working with the uh, U.S. Department of Transportation Thriving Communities Cohort and stakeholders who have joined the Transportation Equity Work Group to develop a Transportation Equity Action Plan for the RTC. The Transportation Equity Action plan is funded by a Caltrans and U.S. Department of Transportation Sustainable uh, Transportation Planning Grant. The work includes an equity-focused analysis of the existing and planned transportation network and a public outreach toolkit that can be used by the RTC and its partners to more proactively engage and collaborate with equity priority communities. The Equity Work Group held its first meeting on November 27th. The work group includes individuals and representatives of groups that have been historically and or systematically marginalized due to race, income, ability, sexuality or gender identity, immigration status, or limited English proficiency. And we appreciate the, uh, uh, the time that uh, all those who applied for the work group are, are putting into, into that effort. It's very important work that will help to improve uh, how we do uh, transportation in Santa Cruz County. 
also our free resource patrol program. Uh, I know we don't say much about about that that service. Uh, there, you know, we have tow, we partnered with a tow truck uh, company, and they're out there on highways uh, one and part of Highway one and Highway seventeen, helping motorists who get stranded and working with the California Highway Patrol uh, to uh, make sure that they uh, clear any incidents to keep the traffic moving. Uh, and typically between the Christmas and New Year's holiday, there's very little activity for them. So they've, they've asked us uh, if they could um, just not have service to, during that week so that their drivers can get uh, can get some time off. And uh, we've done that in the past couple of years and you know, there's been no activity. So that'll happen again this year. There will be no FSP service between uh, Christmas and New Year. Uh, and also has been the case for a number of years, the RTC office will be closed between December uh, 2023 to January 1st, 2024, then we'll reopen on January 2nd, 20. And that concludes my director's report. Thank you very much, Director Mendez. Are there comments or questions from commissioners? Commissioner Schifrin. Need a couple of public comments regarding the dangers on the uh, Murray Street Bridge and the importance of having a rail trail or trail um, that would allow people to stay off that bridge. Um, and there was information, which I think is misinformation, that somehow by going through a rail banking process, it would be possible to have that happen right away. Uh, I don't think that's the case, but I think it would be helpful maybe to the public to get an update on what's happening with rail trail segments eight and nine, which have been approved uh, going from uh, the, uh, Santa Cruz Wharf 217th Street, and which will be providing an alternative to the sidewalks on uh, the Murray Street Bridge. So could you kind of give an update on what the status of that project is? Certainly. Uh, Grace Blakesley, Senior Transportation Planner of your staff, has been leading that, that effort at the RTC, and she will provide some information on that. So you of your staff. Um, the Regional Transportation Commission is working closely with the city of Santa Cruz to implement that project. And I see Nathan and Claire who have been um, taking the lead on that over the last year sitting here in the audience. Um, they, right now they are working through their final design and permitting phase of the project. And then we'll be um, looking to go to construction in spring 2025. Thank you. Um, Grace, before you leave, could you say uh, could you give any estimate of the amount of time that would make if the commission abandoned this project and started on a project that would require the removal of the tracks for a, a uh, interim trail? Well, the environmental phase um, of that project is complete and the commission's action did allow for the RTC to go forward to approve a project for the ultimate trail configuration or the interim trail. The work that would need to be redone is moving from the um, schematic plans um, into final design. Um, so right now they've advanced from 30 to 60 percent design for the ultimate trail configuration and that would need to be redone for an interim trail does design. The, does the commission have the legal right to remove the tra uh, tracks at this time? Um, as discussed at your last meeting, rail banking would need to occur to be able to move forward with the interim trail option. And that requires what? I, I, I could. Uh, I Thanks, Lisa. Like, yeah. uh, so it, you are correct, Commissioner uh, Schiffer, and the commission does not have the legal right at the moment to uh, to remove the tracks. The commission would have to go to through a uh, abandonment and rail banking process before that could potentially happen. Uh, which could be, you know, we do, of course, hear from um, our uh, legal counsel uh, who RTC has hired to let us know about uh, how rail banking might work, that it could be a process that, you know, not take a very long time, maybe a year to 18 months. Uh, but if it is a um, an adverse uh, abandonment and rail banking process, it could take longer uh, if there are, uh, you know, significant there's significant opposition to the commission doing that. Uh, so it's uh, the timing could be uncertain. Well, and let me just remind uh, commissioners and for those in the public who don't know that there will be significant opposition. And wanna, um, we know that from Burn Camp Railroad. We know that from the failure of Measure D in the last uh, election where um, that failed overwhelmingly to approve a project that would have required removal of the tracks. So I think not only does the public 
uh, has the public ex uh, expressed concern about uh, removing the tracks, but it is not something that would happen immediately, which is what some of the testimony is. And in fact, uh, it would at best, and it won't be at best, there will be a big fight. It would be long after um, the implementation of the currently approved segment eight and nine would have occurred. Thank you, Commissioner Schifrin. Any other questions for our executive director? All right, seeing none, this is a non-action item. Thank you very much. I will proceed with the Caltrans report. Good morning, Chair, Ryder. Commissioners, Brandy Ryder. I'm the Deputy District Director for Transportation Planning and Local Assistance in Caltrans District 5. Uh, just one announcement. Uh, we have a community meeting for the Mission Street Pavement Project in Santa Cruz. That is tonight, December 7th, from 5.30 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. at the Police Community Room, which is located at 155 Center Street in Santa Cruz. This meeting will highlight the scope of the project and discuss the findings of the environmental document developed for the project. A flyer for the meeting is located in the full agenda packet and has been sent out via press releases by both uh, Caltrans and RTC. I am available to answer any questions of the board should you have any. Thank you, Mr. Ryder. Are there comments or questions from commissioners? Commissioner Sheffield. Yes, I have a concern um, and I've been in contact with Caltrans. This has to do with the segment five project, a rail trail project from Wilder Ranch to um, Davenport, which has been fully funded um, and is ready to go out to bid. It's being uh, run by a federal agency from uh, FLAP grant is paying all the major share. There's a local share but the federal agency has been spearheading this project. It's been going on for several years. It's complicated. It's uh, either six or seven miles. Um, and we have been very lucky and successful in getting it fully funded. All of the, the uh, RTC staff, the federal staff, has been working with Caltrans throughout this process. Um, and as of last August, all of the concerns had been addressed. And we were expecting that the project would be um, go out to bid in October at the latest. At the last minute, um, after um, Caltrans had had uh, all of their comments submitted on the project in terms of it, the project needs an encroachment permit from Caltrans, um, all the concerns had been addressed. Uh, had been stated, all the concerns had been addressed, and then suddenly there were a bunch of new concerns. And what that has meant is that these concerns do not seem to be really significant, although it's unclear what they are, um, but the Caltrans representative who I heard from said they were unexpected, they were last minute, and they've held up the project. The federal agency is working to resolve those but in fact, what it's meant that instead of going out to bid, um, at best, if everything goes smoothly, maybe it would be possible to go out to bid in December, probably given that the holidays are coming up, we're going out, it will be necessary to wait until January, if not later, to get through these last Caltrans problems. And it just seems to me that um, it's not, it's just very, very disappointing that a partner that the commission has worked very closely with, that the federal agency has worked very closely with, would wait until the absolute last minute to throw a roadblock in the ability to move this project forward. I've, I, I would really urge the Caltrans to consider this. Um, it's not a, a role that I think is a desirable one for Caltrans issue that permit, let them go uh, out to bid, and if there are concerns that need to be done, they can be dealt with later, because they don't, see, you know, there's been three years to work out all these problems. So, um, costs keep going up, construction gets delayed, we get constant complaints about why trails aren't being built, and it's unfortunate that Caltrans is playing a role to make this not happen. 
in an expeditious fashion. So I would definitely appreciate Caltrans' help on this. I've contacted directly um, the studies directly, and I urge you to work with him to try to expedite this process, get this project out to bid so we can start to see progress on. Thank you. Great. And, you know, just to follow up on your comments, um, we have been working pretty closely with FHWA, the federal agency that's carrying this forward. We did, um, this is in specifically regards to some safety concerns and the encroachment permit. And so we're addressing those concerns with FHWA. We did give them the option of doing a conditional use permit to allow them to continue to move forward. And after discussing the changes, they would actually prefer to go ahead and delay the permit and include those in the uh, mapping that they have. It's a short delay as uh, outlined by Madeline, our project manager on this project. However, it will be incorporated into the design. They would like to get the permit um, without conditional use. So we are working through that. Um, and we are expediting that process with our team internally. I understand that, but could I ask why it took um, the Caltrans, after verifying that all the concerns had been met, to come up with these new concerns. That's what's surprising to me. I mean, it, this, the project hasn't changed. It's uh, the, the plans have been um, going through the process, and um, there were three years of opportunity to identify these concerns. So it's very unclear to me uh, why at the last minute Caltrans staff ended up coming up with brand new concerns that now have to be addressed. They may be, you know, reasonable, but why, why wait until after um, all their concerns were supposedly taken into consideration? Yeah, as you know, for most, of, you know, we're a large organization, and in this particular situation, there was an oversight internally to address the concerns, and so. That was something we do apologize for. Uh, it was our traffic safety group was trying to work through uh, the final comments and those comments were overlooked. And so it was an unfortunate delay and we're doing everything we can to amend that with the federal agency. Well, I would certainly appreciate anything that can be done to expedite that process. Yes. Thank you. No problem. Thank you for the discussion. Are there other comments? Sure. Questions? Yes. Uh, yeah, I just, sure. um, I would like, to, I don't know if this is the right place to do it, uh, but I would like to, um, this, um, our, our staff to address uh, the Caltrans issue of 25 miles per hour in general is a serious problem. I just wanted to see if uh, the communication with Caltrans, who has been very cooperative and most everything I've been involved with. Uh, so I would like to see what it would take to uh, reduce that speed limit to 25 direction. Remember to use the correct microphone. Yes, Commissioner McPherson, we, we will work with Caltrans on, on how that process could potentially take place. Thank you. All right, seeing no other comments, thank you very much for the report, Ms. Ryder. We have um, comments from the public. All right, we'll take some public comments now. Mr. Brian Peoples. Hi, this is Brian from Trail Now. Just to give a little more background on the North Coast Rail Trail. You know, we work with the North Coast farmers advocating that those old railroad tracks, the trail be put there. And um, so you, what you're seeing now is exactly what's going to happen on the other trail. A lot of uh, private property um, disputes that are going to occur, and that's why it's taken so long. A lot of people might not know this, but on the North Coast Trail, um, they only have a temporary permit for the trail. The California Coastal Commission would not give a permanent trail because you were building it next to the tracks. So the North Coast Trail is a great example of the, of the barriers we're going to see with the unconventional approach of building an expensive trail next to the tracks. It's very common to build the trail with the removal of the tracks and the idea that Roaring Camp, the private company, is trying to stop us from using it is, is outrageous. And it's outrageous that we support that. So I just want to give you a little more context. The, the delay on the North Coast has been a decade long. 
And it's because you've been building the trail next to the tracks, destroying farmland. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Peoples. Mr. Michael Sait. Uh, yes, thank you, everyone. Um, I have a question for Caltrans or, or whoever else may be able to answer it. And I appreciate uh, Commissioner Schifrin's comments as well. Um, I went to page 23.8 on the report of what Caltrans costs. My concern is the cost of these things. I believe even on the beginning of your agenda, you had something about how they reported that costs have increased 54% from 2.8 billion in 2020, fourth quarter of 2020. And just this last year, costs of doing highway projects has gone up 15.5% from last year. I mean, if that happened at my home or if anybody's business did that, they'd be bankrupt. Um, I went through and did the numbers a little bit and you can correct me if these are wrong. Uh, Freedom to State Park was estimated at 20, 221 million, 41st to Soquel, 35.2 million, State Park to Bay Porter, 94.1 million cost. It's a total of $351.4 million. Uh, and that's not even, that's today's dollars. I mean, you've got another four or five years of getting this all done. And by that time you could be close to a half a billion dollars. Uh, so my question is how much of this does Santa Cruz County have to absorb? And where's the money coming from? I mean, is Cal State of California just gonna absorb it all and uh, increase the costs or their awards that they've given you? And that's pretty much my concern. Thank you for, for listening. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Saint. Mr. Lowell Hurst. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and I wanna say um, kudos to uh, Ms. Ryder and uh, the Caltrans crew for always paying uh, a lot of attention to South County. We're right at the intersection. We're at the crossroads of 152, 129, and Highway 1, three major state highways, and and Highway uh, 152 uh, Main Street in, in the city of Watsonville. You know, there's recently been a uh, another fatality, a, a pedestrian fatality there, on, uh, on the highway, on Main Street. And so whatever we can do to uh, be good partners with Caltrans municipally and regionally, I think that um, Caltrans wants to uh, hear from the constituents of the, of the community and, and try and expedite uh, you know, safety as well as uh, congestion management. So I just wanted to give a shout out to uh, Caltrans and Ms. Ryder for their focus on South County. Thank you very much. Mr. Hurst. And the last speaker, Brett Garrett. I found the unmute button. Um, I just wanna say very quickly, I did some very quick research and it looks like there are solutions for putting a reasonable walking surface between the tracks. Um, as kind of a temporary solution. I don't know about rights of way and, you know, how it works legally, but it, it just seems like for some of the unsafe places where people are, it just seems like people could, could you could have a temporary walking path pretty easily. Um, just something to think about. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Garrett. All right. So on action item, we appreciate the public comment and discussion. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Ryder. We do have a public hearing at 9.45 a.m., or I should say no later than 9.45 a.m. Um, and I do believe that item 24, which is the presentation uh, from Santa Cruz Metropolitan Transit District, does dovetail uh, nicely with this item. So I'm still going to take uh, item 24 first. Uh, after all, uh, in item 25, more than half of the money being considered for award is uh, recommended for Santa Cruz Metro. So I think it's important that we get the update from Metro and uh, understand what the plans are there. So I'd like to welcome up our Metro CEO, Michael Tree. You hear me okay? Yes, it's uh, that microphone is a little touchy, but we All right. Ready. I'll keep my hands off of it. <laughs> it's, um, you know, it's, uh, it's great to be here today. And I uh, recognize lots of commissioners here at the RTC who serve on 
the Metro board. And um, I'm excited to talk about what's going on at Metro. We have been working uh, literally day and night over the last couple of years to put together what we think will be the most transformational change to happen at Metro in its history. And uh, this upcoming vote that you have on the agenda certainly is the key to providing that transformational change in the very near future. So if we could go to the next slide, I'd be happy to talk about uh, the three goals at Metro. I just wanna really briefly review uh, what our board is intently focused on. Um, we met at a uh, all day workshop and we talked about, let's just narrow this down to three things that we can really do better than uh, anyone else in the industry. I mean, the, the vision of Santa Cruz Metro is to be a world-class transit system and an example to the other transit systems around the nation and, and, even, and even in North America as to a progressive world-class system. So. The board's pretty ambitious. Their first goal was to double the ridership in five years, and that would get the ridership to seven million rides a year, which is the highest that it the right it's the highest ridership that Metro has uh, seen in its history. So, uh, within five years, by 2028, get that number up in over seven million. And uh, the second goal was when purchasing new buses. We only wanted to buy buses that didn't have tailpipes, meaning they'd be battery electric buses or hydrogen buses. And here at the local level where those buses run, there would be no air pollution coming from them. And then the third was uh, Metro recognizes it has property uh, at transit centers and other property. And the board set a goal to develop 175 affordable housing units on Metro owned property by the end of the decade. And so I'll, uh, I'll briefly go through points two and three a little bit later, but let's uh, jump right into what's most important at Metro and that's serving the public with great connectivity. And so we could go to the next slide. Yesenia, that'd be perfect. So you can see what COVID did to the, the ridership uh, most recently uh, in Santa Cruz County. To double the ridership uh, is an equally uh, profound uh, graph change in the ridership. This is what that graph would look like for us to reach our goal by 2028. And so you can see the ambition that's built into uh, what we're about to show you. Um, we go to the next slide. So this is the ex existing Santa Cruz Metro service. And uh, there's some good and bad on this map. Um, the good is that there's uh, there's quite a bit of service there. The bad is it's complicated and uh, it has just blue on it. And in, tran in the transit world, uh, dark blue is good. That's 30 minute service, meaning a bus will come to a bus stop every 30 minutes. Light blue is one hour service. Uh, so uh, in transit space, you would call this a mediocre bus system, a bus system that's really built for those who have no other options uh, in their transportation. And it's also complicated. I mean, if I were to hand this map to someone in Watsonville and say, show me how you would get from point A to point B, it would be a blank stare. Uh, it looks like spaghetti thrown on a map. <laughs> and so over the years, this is what happens uh, when uh, a transit agency is having public comment and reacting to public comment. Uh, you begin to have a system that's complex. And because it's complex, you begin to introduce lots of coverage in different areas, which takes down the ability to run a fast, frequent, and reliable uh, public transportation service. So if, I, if you remember nothing else about uh, my presentation today, know that if you want a world-class transit system, it needs to be simple. It needs to be fast frequent and reliable. That's what really uh, jumps the ridership and allows people to uh, feel freedom uh, with their transportation and uh, basically use it as a livable uh, transportation option. So what you don't see on the map uh, that you would definitely see in a world-class transit system is red. And red's usually a color of caution, but in the transit world, red means 15 minute service. and for a real livable system, it's 15 minute all day service. And so this is uh, what the planning has resulted in in creating a world-class transit system for Santa Cruz County. You see lots of red, which is 15 minute all day service. You see straightening of routes 
And uh, I'm excited to even uh, do, uh, uh, you know, some additional adjustments as we move forward in, in our pilot project. But what's exciting about this is that, uh, I'll just give you a couple of examples. If you're living in Capitola and you wanna to ride to the downtown area of Santa Cruz or to the University of Santa Cruz, that will now be a one seat ride, meaning you'll get on the bus and you won't get off the bus until you're at your destination, wherever that may be uh, as you're traveling. Uh, as I mentioned, it's 15 minute all day service. And what's really exciting about this is that every single intersection that you see that has a red line going through it, but we're planning transit signal priority with the public works departments, uh, for whatever jurisdiction that intersection may be in. And so uh, with the uh, transit signal priority, every single trip can save up to nine minutes uh, by not waiting at intersections. The, the uh, technology borrows a few seconds and extends a green light to allow a bus through, or perhaps advances a red light into a green light to get a bus through as it's approaching. So it's imperceivable to the public, but uh, has a, a lot of time savings. And that time savings in a ridership modeling application generates a half a million rides per year just with that transit signal priority. And of course, you're probably thinking, well, what does this new Metro with wave service, which is what we're calling the 15 minute all day service, because just like waves in Santa Cruz County, it comes often and it's a powerful way for uh, residents to start enjoying uh, their Metro service. But uh, what, what does the ridership modeling show with a service like this? Well, the ridership modeling shows that you will surpass 7 million rides during your pilot project. Uh, but we're also uh, unveiling some new announcements in the near future. And if you invite me back in December of 26, I promise you that this service here will be upwards uh, of uh, eight and a half million rides per year, which is over a million rides per year than you have ever carried in the history of, uh, of Santa Cruz Metro. So there's excitement here. I'll just say a few more things before we move on this. Uh, new wave service, it's, uh, it, it necessitates 64 new employees and you have 30 of them here today who are in training, getting ready to introduce your new wave service uh, in the summer of uh, 2024. And uh, that economic impact of those uh, 64 new jobs is more than $32 million to the regional economy. A um, couple other bullet points here that I think are really important. Um, over 100,000 residents will have access to wave service, that 15 minute all day service within a five minute walk. And that's what you want. Uh, lots of people with the ability to very quickly uh, enjoy premium service. And as mentioned, the ridership, uh, the conservative of this is the ridership would increase 7 million rides per year during the, the pilot project. and. I think you're gonna be eight and a half million when I come back and we talk about this at the end of the pilot project in December of 26. I think I have one other page of uh, benefits. Um, the VMT reduction through the ridership increases is right around 9.9 .9 million rides per year. Your emission savings is 40,000 metric tons a year. And the last two were probably just as important as anything else. It's equitable uh, when the, when the wave service is introduced, it's gonna provide great transportation options for everyone, no matter your economic status, no matter your race, uh, this is gonna be a transportation for everyone. And then finally, uh, with quality transportation service, which is multiple routes uh, serving an area with 15 minute all day service, you now have access to a lot uh, more competitive access to state and federal funding so that you can put uh, your housing uh, where the quality transportation is. And so those of you who sit on city councils and on county commissions, you know, your arena numbers are important. You wanna plan that carefully. And uh, the beauty of the, the new wave service is it really begs put your housing here and give people an opportunity to have great transportation right outside their front door uh, and be able to, you know, have those host of ben benefits. 
so I think I, uh, I just wanted to remind you what the wave service looks like. And moving on to the next slide, I just wanted to uh, make sure you're aware of some really fantastic things going on at Metro. And uh, what's really beautiful here about this picture is uh, there's not smog in this picture, and that's the way we want to keep it. The board has worked really hard to put together a portfolio of nine funding sources to recently buy 57 zero emission hydrogen buses. And to complement that, we have the one ride at a time program, which allows uh, residents when they ride Metro, for every 25 times they ride Metro, $10 is contributed uh, to the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary in the Bay of Life to work on really incredible projects. And you can see as we just flash through the next couple of uh, slides, the great work by Franz Lanting and other select artists who have uh, donated their, their work to put on Metro buses to highlight the program and highlight really the beauty of the Monterey Bay through your Metro bus system. And so rounding up my presentation, I just wanted to bring you up to speed on where are we with 175 housing units to be planned and built by the end of the uh, decade. This, of course, is the Pacific Center North project. It's at the uh, on the Santa Cruz property uh, in downtown Santa Cruz, and we have fantastic partners with that. The city, uh, obviously, uh, they have taken the lead on this project. We'll be breaking ground as early as February of 2024 for 120 affordable housing units uh, on and adjacent to the Metro property. So that's an exciting project where we'll really revamp how Metro functions in the downtown area and have uh, a, a really uh, standout uh, housing project that's right where it needs to be. And then finally on the next slide is the Watsonville Transit Center. We're going to completely redevelop that property as well. There'll be approximately 70 affordable housing units on the property. And recently the state gave that uh, project seven and a half million dollars and AMBAG uh, two million dollars. And with our partner MidPen and uh, bonding opportunities, that project is going to uh, basically have a shovel in the ground in the near future as well. And so just uh, my final slide is just bringing to you again, some excitement for Metro and where we're going. Uh, I'm excited to uh, watch you have the opportunity today to put the icing on the cake for uh, the Metro uh, service called the wave service without the dollar amount that you see in your staff report that won't go and that will be postponed. And uh, I just want you to know we are ready. I think Brandon, our uh, union chair at SMART said it best, we have been working towards this for 18 months and uh, we will be ready to go in the summer of 2024 with the wave service. And uh, it's just, a, there aren't very, very many communities in the entire world right now who are making advances the way Metro is. So I'm excited to be a part of that. There's absolutely no doubt the greatest asset at Metro is its employees. And I, uh, I didn't ask anybody to come today, but everyone is interested in, in what's before you because they know it's transformational for everyone. And with that, uh, I'll end my presentation. Thank you very much, CEO Tree. Are there comments or questions from commissioners? Mr. Johnson. Hi, right, Edwin, thank you. Thank you for that um, information. Um, so we have a, our city council has a representative metro on a land and just recently one of her reports said that metro had had or will be not collecting fares anymore and i was kind of dumbfounded because i kept hearing about the shortages of money i said i asked her what kind of business when they're in financial have financial issues like obviously you're telling us you do, stops collecting money from customers. Would you give me a rationale why Metro feels like, and, and not really just giving free passes to people that need it, but each and everybody, regardless of their economic status? It's a great question. And um, I, two things go through my mind. With public transit, we really view it as a public utility for the people. It's a uh, 
It's something that uh, is important to the community to have a balanced transportation. It's something that's important to the community from an equity perspective. It's something important to the community from an environmental perspective and so on. And so it's worthy of having a great transportation system in your community. The fact of the matter is uh, in a transportation system, the way it's set up uh, in public transit is that usually local, state, and federal resources to have a great transportation pay for about eight or $9 out of every $10 that it takes for the system. In other words, about a dollar is uh, a $1 out of 10, or maybe it's $2 out of 10, uh, if you're looking at kind of a general look, uh, from the fare box go to maintain $10 of the system cost, or 20% is paid for by the fare box. And that's probably on an, in, in a really high functioning system. So you take the people, many of the people who ride public transit are doing so because they're very limited in options. And so you take the very most economically challenged residents that you have, and then you charge them cash every time they walk on a bus. I have a hard time in my career uh, fathoming that uh, with so much of the bus system already paid for, that you couldn't reach an, a, a totally new efficiency level with the bus system and a totally new level of equity in your community by going fare free. So that's one consideration in going fare free. The other one's a pretty simple answer and that is because we've got a grant for it. <laughs> And so uh, we have LC top funding that we have uh, pitched to the state to be able to take the project fare free during the pilot project. And so uh, those are the two answers that I'd give you as far as a reason for fare free. Um, I was uh, the general manager in Missoula, Montana, which is a real transit town. You wouldn't think that there'd be a transit town in Montana, but it has the University of Montana in the community. We took the system fare free and the ridership increased 70% on the system. And that includes professors going to the university, business professionals going downtown and students and uh, those who needed that transit system most. So it just shows you your efficiency level of what happens with people loving that system when there are no barriers right. to enter a bus system. No, I understand. Um, I guess the counter is, is that economically challenged people that have a car. There are a lot of poor people that have a car that have to pay for their gas. They also never get a pass on the registration fees. I mean, if they if they own a car, they have to pay registration. I think Caltrans would agree to that. Um, you know, I owe a lot to uh, transit. My my mom was, well, she passed away in 97, lived in um, Watsonville. And uh, she had a habit even at 90 some years old jumping on a bus and going to Kmart because the medications were free or not free, but uh, less expensive. And, you know, the kindness shown by the drivers there to her because she was legally blind. Mom, stop doing this, right? Um, and, the, and then there was also paratransit. You know, for the longest time, we would have to, they lived in uh, Watsonville. It was 23 miles one way. So if they wanted to come for a Sunday dinner, which they did a lot, if we had to pick them up, that was like 95 miles. But the paratransit, and it took a lot to convince them to use it, um, was a blessing because you could set up a, an appointment. Uh, they could come door-to-door uh, -door service. And so uh, that was an option. And again, a, a debt of gratitude to Metro for you know, showing that kindness. One of the things that I think of the challenges of Metro is that you mentioned options. Now I live in a, I live in a neighborhood which is kind of a microcosm of what's happening in the county of Santa Cruz. Where there's a grain of America, right? I mean, a grain of Santa Cruz County, my neighborhood. I see it all the time. Thirty years ago, everybody had kids. The on a Saturday morning, our streets are teeming with uh, playing this rollerblading, whatever. Now it's deader than anything, right? On a Sunday morning. Um, so, you know, one of the recommendations that you often hear, even from committees with, with this agency, is that more money should go to Metro, but private car provides the most freedom for those people in my neighborhood, because I never see them taking a bus, uh, 
probably almost everywhere because they, they now can visit their family wherever that is. They can take trips to uh, get their drugs. They can take trips to visit, um, uh, go to the store, wherever that might be. So, you, you know, um, you, you use the word options and people have options. And what, you know, my experience has been that given the option between driving their car and taking a bus, a lot of people don't take the bus. And, you know, I never, I don't use this to embarrass people, but who drove your car or took a bus today? Did you? The question. Well, no. Did you take a bus? I did not because I needed to go into work first and come here second. But I'll, I'll tell you, uh, Commissioner Johnson, I wouldn't take a bus with your current system. It's mediocre. You don't have a world-class system in Santa Cruz County. And uh, I'll tell you what, when you have 15 minute frequency and you have a world-class system, you're gonna have a whole new level of people who say, wow, I can take my two car household and now make it into a one car household because that works for me. You're gonna take someone who basically is barely making ends meet, which is a whole lot of people in Santa Cruz County. And they're gonna say, I can dump that car and I can save on that insurance and I can save on that maintenance and I can afford to live here now in a whole new way, thanks to world-class system, to a world-class system. So I didn't, So, so Metro, uh, what's before you today really is a world-class system. And even then, uh, Metro's desire is not that everybody jump ship on their car and their transportation options. For a healthy community, you need great transportation options all the way around, and that includes cars. Have you done a peer, any sort of peer studies with, uh, for example, of how the leading fares actually translates into, I mean, uh, you know, more ridership. I mean, our, what ex, number one, what example? Um, and, um, you know, I think goals are, are fine. And you've just explained that if you have a world-class uh, system that somehow, some way, the ridership and the people that are now using their cars, seniors included, will, will kind of magically transform and just know, massive amounts of people using buses. You know, you talk about 7 million trips, but each year on Scotts Valley Drive alone, there are about 7 million trips. So, um, you know, the trip that you describe sounds impressive, but at the same time, is it a significant impact on all the things that you described, namely the environment, uh, people actually using and benefiting from a quote, world-class system? I don't know. Um, I mean, there are promises being made here. Um, and one of the things, you know, from a, from a prospect of the Regional Transportation Commission, we're not an appendage. We are kind of a partner in, in this county as far as transportation goes. Um, you have your half cent sales tax, right? And this agency, when Measure D was passed, granted Metro, I think a full 20% of all proceeds, every every part of that half cent sales tax to go to you all, right? Um, so for the for the person who is looking for not only, you know, Metro, which again is a, is a fantastic and a needed service in this county, I'm not disputing that. For the people that need roads done, that are isolated when you know half a hillside goes away and they can't get out of their house for a, for a month or two and it costs two million dollars to renovate that road um, that's where these scarce dollars notwithstanding the need of metro and all the people here where scarce dollars uh, are you know there there's competition so uh, I'm not disputing the need whatever and I'm not not my intention, it gives me no pleasure to put a damper on this, but there are real needs everywhere, not just a metro. Um, and for the safety, convenience, and you know what you described, uh, the options that people have. You know, if you came down Scotts Valley Drive today, um, we did our level best 
to make sure that by filling cracks that this road that was re really redone 20 some years ago will stay intact. So it looks like hell, okay? So, you know, we need the money to kind of make it look better. Um, so, you know, I just want, I just want to say that, um, you know, whereas Metro has many buckets, at least two or three buckets where we might just have one local or it might be RTC or what have you, um, that's consideration too. So, um, again, I didn't want to put a damper on your presentation. No problem. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. We'll start with Vice Chair Brown. Did you want to? Hello? Oh, okay. Um, Thank you for that presentation, Michael. As a board member for Metro, I have been incredibly impressed with what has been accomplished um, in the past couple of years under your leadership. It is it is truly, um, as you say, it's truly transformed what has been happening at Metro and what we could be doing at Metro when, when we have the support. Um, I do just briefly feel the need to, to respond to some of the comments with respect to Johnson. Because you're correct, there isn't a pass for gas or registration, which is all the more reason, in my opinion, to give those who needed a pass for a transit system that provides them with an alternative to having to pay for that gas and registration costs. And there is discussions in my household right now into going into a one-car household because of the potential bus system improvements um, that are being discussed today. Um, my husband and I have considered that in the next year we can get rid of one of the two cars that we have because of the improved bus system. And I want to share also. Um, that yeah, there's there's a lot of projects with a lot of need, and and Metro is one of them, and the roads and and others. And um, I think it's important to note that SB 125 specifically is for transit systems, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so I wanted to share that information first, um, and then just once again, thank you to all of the staff at Metro, to the operators, uh, to those who are working to become operators, and and again, just Michael, very exciting. Um, I can't wait to see what the the next uh, few years bring us. I think that has this has implications not just for transit and transportation, but as previously mentioned in housing and housing development and what that means for our county as well for job creation and economic um, prosperity here. Um, so I'm I'm just thankful for, for what you've shared and I'll save the rest of my comments for uh, our, our next step. Thank you, Vice Chair Brown. Commissioner Hernandez. Thank you. So first of all, I wanna commend um, the Metro, Michael Tree, and all the drivers as well uh, for moving forward on all, all the um, ambitious goals that you have and moving forward with those and meeting a lot of them. And also something that wasn't mentioned is uh, your guys' uh, ability to move forward in seeking grants. Um, I think that that's really important for things like you just mentioned about uh, the free fare for all programs, but also prior to that, uh, when you guys allowed students to ride for free. I think that that was something really important for South County uh, for, to, you know, for students to ride for free. Um, and I think that, you know, uh, it, it, you know, one of the things that I'm really impressed is, you know, moving, that you guys are also moving beyond transportation into the realm of what cities and counties do and building affordable housing and in essence, just creating your own ridership by by building transit-oriented development. So I'm really impressed, you know, and you guys seeking the grants to do that. It's really forward-thinking, everything that you guys are doing. So thank you. I commend you guys and applaud every, all the work you guys are doing. Thank you, Commissioner Hernandez. Commissioner Montesino. Yes, you know, um, I represent the city of Watsonville. And for the city of Watsonville, a lot of uh, our, our communities are transit-dependent. And and what we need to say, this plan calls to you know the the not just cater to the transit dependent but to, to encompass everyone in the community. So it's a game changer for uh, for just my community where we don't have to be locked in in the highway all the time. These are the transportation endeavors that we should be taking. These are the uh, you know because uh, uh, the rail trail is a nice concept, but I'm not going to ride a a bike from Watsonville to Santa Cruz to get a job. So, you know, and this is a, a game changer in, in our community to be able to 
try to move community from that space. I just I had a meeting with a developer that looking at this 15 minute service is gonna pre, pre, uh, provide him the opportunity to find a grant to build affordable uh, another affordable housing project just in the downtown. So it just it just calls out to the community, calls out to the housing opportunities that we desperately need every city. So I mean, this is this is what the transportation needs in our community. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Montesino. Mr. Kalantar Johnson. Thank you. Um, I'm not normally here. I'm here as an alternate for the Santa Cruz Metro and serve as the current chair of the Metro. I want to thank you, Mr. Tree, for the presentation and thank all of you for being here and showing your support. Um, appreciate the questions, Commissioner Johnson. Um, I think they're important ones as we make these decisions. Um, I do want to just highlight the youth cruise free that Commissioner, um, uh, Commissioner uh, Hernandez, I think, spoke to. Um, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I know that we've seen in the short amount of time, less than a year that we've had this pilot project, that we have seen increased ridership. Um, so those are good questions. Those are questions that I think we will be able to answer with our small pilot of Youth Cruise Free and what other communities have done. Um, and I'll just say, you know, I have, I have a 15 and a half year old. He has a permit. Watch out, everyone. But with, <laughs> with very little interest in um, getting in a car. And I think it's an opportunity, we have an opportunity right now to really shift the culture of the next set of car dependent people like myself, I'll admit it, I'm car dependent and haven't consistently ridden the bus since I was in grad school and had to commute over Highway 17. Um, so we have an opportunity here to shift the culture, shift our operations to be world-class and shift the culture so that the next generation, like my 15 and a half year old son, isn't that eager to hop in a car. So. Thank you for the presentation and um, thank you for the work. Yeah, just to follow up the uh, the ridership increase, uh, Chair Koenig is 400% uh, for the youth who have taken advantage of the youth cruise free. Thank you. Commissioner Quinn. Terrific presentation, thank you. You have my support today. Um, but there was one thing missing from the presentation that I'm curious about. Could, Commissioner Quinn, could you just lean into the microphone a little bit more so the folks yeah, on terrific line. report. Thank you very much. You have my support today. Missing from the presentation, though, was the question of economic sustainability. Given the expansion of services, given the fact you're going fare free, given the willingness of taxpayers to pay more taxes, and given how intensely competitive these funds are, are we confident that your plan is going to have economic sustainability? So that's a really good question. It is a three year pilot. And I will tell you that uh, community leaders, including uh, Mayor uh, Fred Keeley, have uh, started assembling community leaders and community opinion leaders to basically talk about Metro and talk about how to advance the pilot into a permanent status beyond uh, the three year pilot project. So. I think there's a whole portfolio that would go into the ability for Metro to keep it going. Uh, I'm a risk taker, but I'm a very calculated risk taker. And I think from a public perspective, uh, guarding the uh, public funds, I think you have a very good chance with a, uh, an investment from the local community, but also an investment from the state and the federal government uh, to make that pilot become permanent, uh, make it a reality after the three years. Uh, your state and your federal government have really noticed what uh, Santa Cruz County has been up to with the Metro system. And just to give you an example, in the last 18 months, there have been $113 million of investment in Metro from the state and the federal government. So it just gives you an idea that they recognize the value of public transit and they want to reward communities who are thinking beyond just a simple basic system, but they're rewarding communities that want to make their public transit livable. But yes, it will, it will include additional investments uh, to keep that pilot going, but uh, you have great community leaders working on it behind the scenes who are optimistic. Thank you, Commissioner Quinn. Commissioner Schiffrin. Follow up on that and ask about uh, what the cost of, I think it's very exciting to have a 15 minute um, system and it will make a difference. I think it's, you know, it's unclear how much of a difference it will make. 
Um, I remember when the sales tax was passed in 1978. I don't know how many people here do remember that? Um, but it was going to be transformative, and it was transformative in terms of uh, the ability of people to ride buses that they never had before. It made a big difference. But in terms of long-term ridership, as I understand it, uh, the modal share at this time is about 3% of the rides. Um, doubling that, which is what you're proposing for two years, will make it 6%. I think it's very desirable. It's an important program. But it's, my guess, my question is, what is it going to cost to do that? Um, I assume that the pilot is being paid from one-time funding. And is that one-time funding for the three years? Is it for the one year? Uh, could you talk a little bit about how much it's going to cost to do this? Because it's a, you know, it's a significant cost that makes a significant difference. And it certainly would be desirable. But the community already makes a pretty strong contribution to the transit system. And um, I'd just like to get a sense of how much more of a contribution is going to be asked for. Yeah. Well, the, the pilot project um, comes right out at $32 million for the three years. And that is exactly the dollar amount that's being recommended by your staff in your next agenda item. So that gives you an order of magnitude as to the incremental increase between what we're uh, providing today and what the cost would be uh, you know, during the pilot and after the pilot. Um, you know, I'd be remiss to say that, um, again, a healthy community includes lots of different transportation options. And if you looked at the uh, subsidies of your roadways really in detail, you would probably notice that they are probably a lot more than you have even uh, begun to envision for public transit in the area. But I would be remiss, uh, Metro is on board with supporting all transportation options, including the car. It's not our job to try and tell people to get out of their car. We wanna provide great options where they feel free and feel excited to get out of their car and, and provide benefits to the community that we've been talking about. And this, uh, quite frankly, uh, this project is uh, what the state and the feds will wanna see as you contemplate moving forward with rail in the future. This is an early ridership builder exercise for the ridership potential on a passenger rail system. Without this project, uh, I would be uh, I would be a lot less confident that you're gonna move forward with other transportation options in your community that will take significant investment, not only at the local, the state, but the federal level. So uh, the answer to your question though is 32 million over three years and that that would continue beyond. And I think that's where your community leaders figure that between state, federal and some local investment, they can make that happen. I'm glad you mentioned rail because I really see, uh, see the potential of rail as a part of the uh, uh, public transit system in the long run. And I think this is a really desirable increase in uh, an important improvement in the short run but I, I'm concerned about it undermining the ability of a longer run option that would also be very beneficial to public transit. So um, I appreciate your answer. I'm getting it's about $12 million a year to run this program. And yeah. um, you know, it's, a, it's a significant increase in certainly the amount of local, uh, annual local funding that's going on. We'll have a pilot that maybe will have some good data on whether it's really achieved the goals that you have. And I think that will be really important in, um, in justifying the continued funding of it over time. So I am supportive of the program. As you know, I'm a little concerned about sort of how it is, how the funding is being distributed at this point. So we'll talk about that. At the next item. Thank you, Commissioner Schifrin. Commissioner Peterson. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it was a great presentation. I just had one quick question. Yeah. Uh, for the fare free program, is that designed to be just for the three years, or is, is your plan to have that be an ongoing aspect with Metro moving forward past the trial? 
Well, given my past experience with fair free and explosive ridership that happens when you when you have fair free environment, um, I think uh, I think my end goal and the end goal of the board and the community would be to continue fair free if it shows the same type of reaction that I've seen with it in the past. I think Santa Cruz County is very progressive and there are a lot of people who would enjoy great transportation options. And when you take out the hurdle of fumbling for a dollar, trying to find where you left your transit pass, people just say it's an expression of freedom. Get out and ride and enjoy the system. And so I think the goal of the community would be to keep it, but we're running it as a pilot to make sure that the results uh, can be talked about and then, uh, you know, we can go from there. Great, thank you. That's very exciting. Yep. Here's in Commissioner Quinn. I hate to pile on, but I would love to see a sensitivity analysis on ridership versus fare. And I'm in healthcare. We do the same thing about barriers to care. And there is a tipping point where people are, but it's not zero. And so I think it's worth doing, if nothing else, just doing the math in your head, $12 million a year and 8 million riders, that's a buck 50 a ride. Um, so I think it'll be important to integrate a fair sensitivity analysis. Thank you, Commissioner Quinn, Commissioner Sandy Brown. Thank you, Chair, uh, and thank you, uh, Mr. Tree, for the presentation. It's an incredible vision you have. It's it's wonderful to see uh, so many people who um, you know work for this organization who really believe in the vision <laughs> and. Um, I don't doubt that you're going to do great things. Um, and um, I, I just wanted to respond very quickly because people are asking this question, you know, do we have, is there peer, peer reviewed material, sensitivity analysis? And Mr. Tree, you mentioned your, your own experience. Um, there is significant, um, I just uh, use my uh, a search for um, some of the, my favorite uh, planning journals that I use and there's significant material showing I mean, study after study and aggregate studies of hundreds of transit districts um, that there is a positive correlation, sometimes very significant, uh, between uh, free fares and increased ridership, um, almost as close in, in one of the studies I just looked at as um, the increased uh, time, the headways. So, um, you know, it depends on the community, but and this, this study aggregates for small and large communities. So I just wanted to share that, um, that the data seems to, uh, really support um, what you're saying. And, um, you know, Santa Cruz obviously is unique. We all, we're, you know, we are unique. Um, but I think that that experience suggests, um, you know, positive uh, potential there. Thank you, Commissioner Andy Brown. I see no other questions. I, I, well, I actually have a question for you, Michael. Um, which is, when we've talked about this, bu the budget for this program at the Metro Board, um, it, we were you know, obviously this whole improvement uh, with the wave service will greatly help UCSC students. Um, I have lots of UCSC students that live in District One throughout Live Oak and SoCal, and being able to take a direct route up to the university will be a, a huge improvement. Um, and I know that we'd also hope that UCSC will kick in some funding for this expanded service. Um, is ex you know how much are we dependent on their contributions? Uh, or not in order to roll out these three 15-minute headways fare free for the next three years? Yeah. Um, so the university is excited to, for the, the new service, the WAVE service. And um, I would characterize our discussions as optimistic in the potential for the university to help financially uh, towards the, uh, the, the changes um, we haven't exactly hammered out all of the uh, details yet. It's a it's ongoing. Um, I'll be totally honest with you. What you see as a recommendation in your next agenda item includes money for rail, which we were supportive of, but it is the contingency on the new wave, the uh, the wave service. And so the hope is that the uh, university will replenish the contingency to give us a more comfortable operating uh, budget to work with. 
again, I wouldn't want to throw out a dollar and cents uh, figure that we're working with with the university because of conversations are very fluid, but I'm very optimistic that there'll be a partner on this and that they can replenish the $2 million and perhaps even a little more to just give us some operational uh, flexibility as we move forward during the three-year pilot project. Right. Um, all right. I guess the core of my question is, will we'll be able to move forward uh, with this service with or without the university's participation? So That's correct. It will take a lot of great management to keep the budget dialed in during the three-year pilot. Um, so we can. And, uh, uh, but we're looking for a robust partnership from the, the university and I'm not seeing any signs that would indicate they'd wanna do otherwise. Obviously hopeful that they will contribute as well. Um, I'll just add that I'm extremely supportive of this program. I think it might actually be the effort that I am most excited about in our public sector today, all our public sector projects. First of all, uh, with the Youth Ride Free program, I think uh, I hear from more happy parents about this program than any other policy initiative I've, I've worked on. Uh, folks who come up and say, thank you so much for implementing this service. It has liberated me from having to drive my kids around town. Uh, they're just, you know, see you, mom, I'm off to the boardwalk or, uh, you know, off to, off to my job, off to hang out with my friends. And, you know, to this question about, you know, is it worth the $1. fifty? Is it worth the $2? Uh, the response I'm hearing is absolutely yes. I mean, first of all, we see in the data 400% increase. You can't make those numbers up. Uh, and feedback, again, that I'm hearing is, you know, I used to have to scrounge around for change in the morning for that fare for the bus. And if we couldn't find it, if we were short, I was driving my kids to, to school or to wherever. And now that it's fare free, I know dependably that they can take the bus every single day. And when we look at what increases ridership, it's people choose the transportation option that is the fastest or the cheapest or the most fun. Thank you, drivers and drivers in training, because you are the fun part, uh, <laughs> as you heard. And, um, and we'll, you know, this will certainly make it the cheapest option out there. Um, that's really exciting too, because I mean, we do need to ultimately compete with the private automobile uh, and this will definitely make riding the bus the cheapest option, but it'll also in many cases make it faster or if not the fastest option as well, because now you won't have to worry about parking on both ends. And rather than, you know, having a, a system where you don't not quite sure when the next bus is coming, um, there's, you know, you know, there's one coming in at least the next 15 minutes on these major routes. And uh, that if you just walk out to the corner, you'll be able to catch one with uh, no change in your pocket and boarding front or back door. I think that's the other thing that wasn't really touched on with the advantages of fare free is that you now can board the bus front and back. And uh, that is a significant time saving for everyone and makes this whole system more dependable. But it's, it's not, uh, that's, it doesn't end there. As was mentioned by Commissioner Montesino, the really transformative part of this is how it unlocks affordable housing. In my very own district, I think one of the most significant sites, 41st and SoCal Drive, when I took office, uh, we were talking about making that into a car dealership. And now, thanks to this project, it could become a 100% affordable housing project instead. I think that's exactly the kind of transformation that our community needs, and it's made possible by this reimagined Metro project. Furthermore, uh, as was mentioned, we've received $113 million in state and federal investment and will soon have the largest fleet of hydrogen buses in the nation. I think we owe it to the state and the whole country to show that we can fill them because that is just going to build on the excitement of what this kind of a program can do for every community. So uh, I'm, if you can't tell, really excited about this program and uh, let's get on to a vote to fund it. So, uh, well, actually, I do believe we need to take some public comment on this. Uh, Commissioner Schifrin. Housing, uh, I'm pretty familiar with that project in downtown Santa Cruz. And I was a little concerned that the, that the slide indicated that it wouldn't be completed until the end of the decade. Uh, my understanding is that the housing portion has already received significant funding. Uh, I really want to compliment Metro. I mean, I think it's great that after years of talking back and forth between the city and Metro, um, I think after you got here, it made a difference. And 
there's now a real project and a real plan to implement it. So I'm just wondering why the uh, estimate is for like seven years from now before it's completed. Could you talk a little bit about the timeline? I'd love to see it sooner. Yeah, you know what? Um, I should have given a little further detail. So it's to get all 175 units done within the decade. And so the Santa Cruz project led by the city of Santa Cruz is 120 units. It'll break ground in February. It'll probably be done in 18 to 24 months, something in that level of a time frame. And we'll break ground soon on the Watsonville project. And then actually we have the additional project that Chair Koenig referred to. It's a project that's on uh, the intersection basically of SoCal and Highway 1. And we're looking at 60 additional units in planning with that. So all told, there's 240 units in planning. They're all in different stages. And our hope is to get them all done by the end of the decade. But certainly your project, like the downtown Santa Cruz project, it's fully funded. It's ready to go. It'll be built as quickly as the city and, and the partners. Well, thank uh, you for that, that clarification, because I you do might. not understand um, that you were really talking about three projects, yeah, or at least two, yep, um, and now three, and I, I think that's great. So thank cool. you. Yep, thank you, Commissioner Schifrin. All right, looks like we have a few public comments, uh, and I would ask you to to be brief. As so the next item, I'm sure we'll touch on some of these elements as well, and of course, we'll uh, would be appropriate to comment on Metro uh, during item 25, our public hearing, since uh, they'll be receiving or are recommended to receive funding. So uh, let's begin with Mr. Peoples. Hi, hi, this is Brian Peoples from Trail Now. Um, great work, Michael Trees. You're doing phenomenal work. We really support, let's make Metro great. Love the work you're doing. Um, just to baseline everybody, we, I am a one car family, but the way we do that is through bike, through an e-bike. And, and so Mr. Trees, it is a two-way street. I will tell you that you're not being very supportive of our efforts your Metro board members on the RTC are, are preventing the rail banking of the coastal corridor. And they're doing it to support Roaring Camp. And we're, we're so it's a two way street. We're asking for you to be more supportive. Uh, Guy Preston recommended rail banking years ago. It was really embarrassing the way the board treated him and um, positioning Roaring Camp over him. But again, I really agree with what you're doing. I think it's going to be phenomenal. We got to have make Metro great, and let's do it. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Peoples. Hurst. I just want to offer my quick uh, commendations and kudos to uh, Michael Tree and his entire crew. You know, he didn't get here all by himself, and somebody made some pretty good selections. Regarding uh, access and removing barriers, it's a game-changing plan. This is transformational. People need to get to work. People need to get to school. People need to get to their health care providers as well. The 15-minute frequency will be a real game-changer. And I say dream big and work hard and build some ridership. And please don't forget about South County. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hurst. Mr. Garrett. Hi, this is Brett Garrett from Santa Cruz. Um, I'll admit to some hesitation about hydrogen, but overall, these are great ideas, fantastic improvements. Um, I have a book recommendation regarding free public transit. The book is called Free Public Transit and Why We Don't Pay to Ride Elevators. The book is a compilation of many case studies by various authors showing what happens in a fair free situation. And gosh, I'm sure the bus drivers will appreciate when they don't have to enforce the payment of bus fares. Um, I, I also want to make a suggestion regarding the affordable housing projects. Um, there's going to be a lot of people who want to use in these projects. And I hope we can prioritize the people that don't have cars that are living there so that they can use transit. Uh, so I suggest to look into whether you can require people to sign an agreement that says, if I live here, I will not own a car. I've heard this has been done successfully in other communities, although I, I wasn't able to find where, I, I think maybe Massachusetts. Um, anyway, I really want to congratulate Mr. Tree for making huge improvements to the bus system. Um, I'm obviously a advocate for personal 
uh, rapid transit, but more frequent service and more direct service brings us a lot closer to the potentials of uh, personal rapid transit. And Mr. Tree is doing that within the constraints of a bus system. So thank you. And I urge RTC members to support. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Garrett. Mr. Saint. Mr. Saint. Yeah, the unmute button just came up. Um, thank you, Chair Koenig. Uh, as you know, I've been advocating for about seven years for more money for Metro. I think it's a very, very good program. I want to thank Michael Tree for all his efforts. Also, I'd like to thank you, Michael, for coming to a campaign for sustainable transportation's conference in August and uh, sort of informing on, us on this uh, previously. Um, funding and, of course, subsidies and stuff seem to be a real uh, issue with a lot of the mass transit programs people try to enact. Um, I think there's even could be a, a combination of PRT and bus service with Metro and maybe even having Metro run both services together. Um, the headways on PRTs are much closer, three to five minutes versus 15. Uh, I'm sure that's a workable situation in the long run. Um, also, if funding is exhausted for the free program for whatever reason, a PRT could continue to operate at the fare box uh, with no additional taxes or looking for subsidies. Great program, CFST supports it, and we'd like to see a yes vote on the next subject. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Saint. Ms. Faulkner. Thank you, can you hear me? Thank you, commissioners and staff. Michael Tree and Metro staff have done a brilliant job in working to bring a world-class public transit system to our community. Our community's goal to bring more housing and Metro's amazing efforts to ensure more people who can work here and stay and live here means that we must take strong steps to reduce traffic as more people need to travel to and from work and school, and Metro is doing just that. Giving people real options to get out of their cars is critical in addressing the increase in traffic on our highways and surface streets. As we build more housing, it is increasingly critical. Doing our part in addressing climate change will also be addressed with this world-class bus system. So many more families today, including my own family, share or want to share a car in order to save money. And my own family regularly rides the bus. My son is very excited for the service to go fare free to get to and from work when he doesn't ride his bike to work. Metro realizes how important it is to address equitable access to the many people who cannot afford or do not want to drive a car. Many people have spoken to me, including our seniors who can no longer drive, youth who cannot yet drive, and many of our professionals, community members who are committed to getting out of their cars and into public transit, including people like my husband, who has been committed to riding the bus or some form of mass transit for over 25 years. We're very excited to hear about these goals from Metro. And we want to thank Metro for providing Youth Ride Free, a groundbreaking change for our community. Huge kudos to Michael Tree and the Metro staff and the bus drivers who work diligently to help provide and do so much for our community so quickly in the last 18 months. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Faulkner. Mr. Sawyer. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you, Chair Koenig and commissioners. I spoke briefly before uh, uh, Zen, uh, head of affordable, head of uh, Zen Development, an affordable housing developer, partnered with Link Housing and proposing a 150-unit affordable housing community at SoCal and 41st. Um, and uh, there's been several references this morning to 15-minute uh, peak headway, increasing the ability to capture state funds and produce affordable housing. I just wanted to reiterate that that's not theoretical. That's immediate immediate results. If this funding gets approved and peak headway goes to 15 minutes, we can build 150 units uh, of affordable housing on that site and capture $40 million of state funds if we do not 
uh, approve that 15, the funding for a 15 minute peak headway, it becomes very difficult uh, to do that. Um, so I just wanted to uh, bring to your attention that it's immediate results that we can get uh, with, with this particular uh, nexus. Uh, so I would uh, encourage your approval of the funds. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Sawyer. Don. Sean? It wasn't that long ago that Metro received a good boost in funding and um, much needed as has been talked about today. RTC already knew, Metro already knew, um, already had a long list of, uh, of uh, how Metro was failing the disabled community. So the public was really happy to see that boost in uh, funding uh, because it was seen especially helpful for Paracruz. Now when RTC wants to, they'll take that money away. Uh, uh, Koenig put a, uh, you know, table the idea, let's take that extra funding and let's put it on road. And um, uh, we, we need to know, we need to know that money is not going to be moved around and taken away from, you know, what's meant in part to meet the needs of the disabled community all across Santa Cruz County. This is, uh, <clears throat> it's one of the most important issues in Santa Cruz County. One out of four Americans identifies as having a disability. Um, one of the supervisors, um, one of the commissioners talked about <clears throat> You know, in his neighborhood, cars great, you know, but um, someone in South County said, please don't forget about South County. Public transit is for everybody. It's not for people who just look like you, uh, have a similar experience to you, you know, um, live a life like you do. It's for everyone. And you're not going to take the needs of the disabled community lightly. Thank you, Sean. Do we have any comments here in the room? Uh, maybe twist it a little bit and uh, check if it's on. How good. about that? All right, sounds like it's good. I don't gotta yell this time. So this is a really interesting thing for me to say given the history of the last 13 years that I've been working for Metro. Um, for those of you who know me, you already know that public transit is my life. Um, besides the paycheck that I require to function in our system, what I really get paid in is the satisfaction of knowing that I'm making a difference for those who need me. And that goes for pretty much everyone else here, too. That's why we do what we do. It's a really nice feeling to know that I have a CEO now that understands that, that we can stand behind and say everything he just said is correct. I'm not going to deny or have to say anything. There's no asterisk. It's true. When we talk about things for free fares, what pops into my mind immediately is those who need it the most. Yeah, maybe some people can afford to pay for it. That's always going to be the case. And I'm very happy for them to be in that situation, but it's not really for them. It's for those who cannot. I've spent the majority of my career operating the 35 and the 42 in areas that are not really conducive to walking. They're dangerous roads the people who drive them drive dangerously and there's a high volume of accidents that's something that you don't get with our operators you don't get a high volume of accidents you get safe reliable transportation that's what we're trying to build when we went fare free for the students i cannot tell you how many times i'd gone to slv high school and watched 100 kids walk down highway 9 with no sidewalk you will not see that today because they are on our bus that impact was immediate. It removes the barrier. We should be doing that from one side of the county to the other. It should not even be in their mind, man, I have to walk down here in this sketchy area. No. 15 minutes from now, someone will come and pick you up and you will be safe. 
You're investing in safety. You're investing in equity. You're investing in all of these things that you cannot get in a car. We talk about roads, they're important. We talk about the rail, it's important. What wears down a road? Use. About 40 people in here brought maybe 35 cars down Scotts Valley Drive this morning. We brought 70 in one. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Freeman. Mr. Sandoval. So James Sandoval here again, uh, VP for Smart Transportation. And so by being VP, uh, we represent all the locals across our country. And I've traveled from state to state experiencing the transit systems that are out there. And I've had it numerous times where if I miss a bus, I know 15 minutes the next bus is going to pick me up. And I've been a bus driver here at Metro for over 10 years. And I got this experience firsthand how we let our community down time and time after again for a long time where if you miss one route, your whole day's ruined. And who knows if you're even going to get picked up. And that is not a service that anybody could trust. And first impressions are everything when you try something out. So we have a lot of work to do to build that trust back up. And so when I, when I talk about a lot of the issues that come with, with the system that we currently have, I mean, we, let's not neglect the fact that we have traffic every single morning and afternoon that delays everybody almost over an hour. And public transportation needs a lot more focus and energy right now. And going back to the comment of why would a business go and say that we should not collect fares? Um, we're not a business. We're a public agency. We're a public service. And we were run like a business for a really long time. And that's the reason why we are where we're at today, because we've treated our system like a business. And our community has suffered for so long so long and just one real quick comment about the free fares that we haven't really talked about today it will prevent the conflict of fare and operator assaults are at an all-time high across the country and if we could even avoid one situation where a conflict led to a death of one of our operators that's worth it to me and so um i just want to say that we have great vision we have great leadership at metro our ceo has got a great plan our Metro Board of Directors have been supporting us and our union has been working together with everyone here. So this is a product, Reimagine Metro is a product of all of our members at Metro, including our community working together. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sandoval. Hi, my name is Jessica. I live on the west side of Santa Cruz. Um, thank you, Chair and Commissioners, thank you. Mr. Tree, for your presentation, I'm super excited to see this new program from Metro. Um, I moved to Santa Cruz as a 18 year old to go to Cabrillo. Um, I lived in Santa Cruz for a long time without a car, rode the bus. Um, I rode my bike. It was not always easy. Um, and now I, I advocate for bike infrastructure. I advocate for public transportation infrastructure. And the one thing that I is my takeaway from this project is that when you build a system that is only for people who cannot drive, you are building a system that is going to be inferior. And you're not really going to meet their needs. And you're also, you know, asking people to pay for something who already don't have enough money to have a car, which is sort of like the idea. We all want a car. And, you know, if you don't have one, well, then, you know, boo-hoo, and maybe we'll give you some scraps. But having a system that is big enough and high quality enough that everyone wants to ride it means that you can change the way that everyone lives. You have better quality of life for everyone in the community. Um, young and old, rich and poor, we're all on the bus together. We're all on the train together. It makes a really dramatic difference for quality of life for everyone. I'm super excited about this project and I really hope that you support it. I hope that you support it without any amendments. Leave the 2 million for rail. That is an important starting place to show our commitment to continuing to grow 
our system and the quality of our system. And more and more people will be getting out of their cars and we'll all be living together and traveling together. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Hello, my name is Elmer Torres. I've been working for a Santa Cruz Metro for the last 25 years. And I never seen anything like it, like the plan that our CEO presented this morning. I mean, they talked about building housing. They talked about uh, re uh, building the uh, downtown uh, Pacific Station, but never happened. I saw plan after plan, Claire, you, you know this. And so we, we saw it uh, time after time, but now, to see what it's been proposed here is exciting. And so I sit in traffic uh, on Highway 1 every day, and I you know I've been doing this for probably 20 years now, sitting in that traffic there, and it's getting worse and worse. Um, so I'm very excited about that plan, but I just wanted to say that that service uh, way that we're talking about today without the proper funding is going to be a, a very ugly tsunami. So before you vote on this, remember that we need the funding to be able to make this happen. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Torres. Hello, Council. My name is Kimberly Moon, and I've never seen this type of scene only on TV. So, um, you know, I wanted to be courageous and stand up here and let you know that my name is Kimberly Moon. I just got hired on as a bus operator and started three days ago. So I've been in training for three days. Um, I just have to say that um, after I say this, I'm either going to have fame or get fired. So, um, so um, I just moved here from Las Vegas, uh, Nevada. I uh, moved to San Jose in September, um, September 8th. And I have to share with you, um, I come from a, a very dark place. I'm an addict in recovery. I'm an ex-sex worker. I'm an ex-gambler. Uh, and I remember the days I didn't even have a dollar to get on the bus. I'm in recovery now, and I just started a new career. And not having a dollar to get on the bus when I was in active addiction or not in active addiction, because now that I've been clean and sober, not having a dollar to get on the bus has been very humiliating. Almost to the point where you just want to give up. And this idea that Metro has is absolutely phenomenal because there's millions out there struggling with addiction, with sickness, poverty. Okay, so I mean, it's just an amazing, amazing, amazing project. I'm so grateful to be a part of. I now, I couldn't, I didn't have a dollar to take the bus. Now I'm driving it. I have a career now. And you know, I'm pretty raw. So I'm either gonna get fired or I'm gonna have fame. But all I have to say is that I love Metro. It's a great place to be. They are like family to me and I really hope that you make the right decision and support us. We need you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Moon. I see no one else here in chambers. Uh, that was a non-action item. Of course, uh, we will now move on to significant action item. Our public hearing I told you it would be no sooner than 9.45 a.m. And sure enough, uh, it is 11.15, but we are gonna begin uh, adoption of the 2023 Consolidated Grants Program, Senate Bill SB 125 Transit Funding Grants Program and Regional Transportation Improvement Program. I will open the public hearing and we will begin with a presentation by our transportation planner, Amy Naranjo. Uh -huh. Take it away, Amy. Good morning, commissioners, project sponsors, and community members. My name is Amy Naranjo, and I'm a transportation planner for the RTC. It's my pleasure today to present staff recommendations for awarding $61.3 million to 23 projects located throughout Santa Cruz County. Please note that the staff report has been updated since the original agenda packet was circulated last week. Revised staff recommendations reflected in underline and strike through formatting were incorporated in your agenda packet earlier this week. Next slide, please. So 
As the state designated RTPA or Regional Transportation Planning Agency for Santa Cruz County, the RTC is responsible for selecting projects to receive funding. The RTC selects projects to receive funds after evaluating applications to ensure that funds are allocated to projects that will provide the greatest benefit to our community. RTC advisory committees review these applications and provide their valuable feedback on the proposed projects to help ensure that the RTC's funding decisions are informed by a diverse range of perspectives. After the advisory committees review the projects, a public hearing is held, which we're at today. This is an opportunity for members of the public to learn more about the proposed projects and to provide their input on the RTC's funding decisions. And depending on the funding source, projects that are then programmed or projects that are for receiving awarding today are then either programmed in the RTC's Regional Transportation Improvement Plan, Improvement Program, excuse me, and or included in the RTC's budget. Next. So this summer, the RTC issued a consolidated call for projects for 26.6 million in RTC discretionary funds. That includes the 17.4 in step, or excuse me, in regional surface transportation exchange funds, 8.6 million in STIP funds, and 629,000 in local partnership program funds. In addition, we uh, we issued uh, the call for 37. Point or excuse me, $34.7 million in one-time formula funds through the SB 125 program. And that includes the 27.6 in TERSIP funds and 7.1 in the zero emission transportation program. Uh, next slide, please. So the RTC approved the, the evaluation criteria that was used to evaluate these projects at their August uh, commission meeting. While all the projects that were submitted for consideration are consistent with the RTC's approved metrics, it is not possible to fully fund every project. The staff recommendation is designed to address a variety of fun RTC funding priorities, including maintenance of the existing transportation infrastructure, filling gaps in the existing bicycle and pedestrian network, improving safety, reducing the number of vehicle miles traveled and associated emissions, as well as promoting equitable distribution of benefits and promoting a multimodal transportation system. Next, please. So a total of 23 project applications were submitted by sponsors, seeking over $95 million in funding from the discretionary pot and SB 125 transit pot. All projects are recommended for at least partial funding. In the following slides, I'll provide a summary of each project and the proposed recommendation for funding. For projects that are recommended for partial funding, project sponsors may either reduce the project scope and implement a portion of the project or increase local or other funds committed to the project or to work to, to secure grants for the, for the project. So first, next slide. So the first group we have here are system preservation projects that include complete streets features. Uh, we have two projects from Scotts Valley. One is on Mount Herman Road and the other is on Scotts Valley Drive. Uh, both, of these, uh, both of these projects include pavement repair um, that's funded through Measure D funds and the recommended funding uh, will implement um, the design for uh, bike and pedestrian improvements, including ADA curb compliant ramps and um, and, and, and um, studying a lane diet on Scotts Valley Drive. Uh, and then the recommendation award is, let's see, I can't read those up here. Um, let's see, the, the next set of uh, projects here are the Bay Street and Bay Corridor projects, and those are through the city of Santa Cruz. Um, for the Bay Corridor design, it's complete streets designed for the entire corridor between High Street and West Cliff, West Cliff Drive. The design effort includes protected bike lanes on the entire corridor, transit boarding islands, intersection modifications to, and excuse me, and intersection modifications to improve the multimodal roadway safety. Uh, the next uh, project there is the Bay Street paving, and that repaves Bay Street between Mission and Lenox and it installs ADA curb compliant ramps at three intersections. The, the next set of projects here is Escalona Complete Streets that repaves Escalona between Grandview and Bay and between Walnut and Highland, and it installs 50 ADA compliant curb ramps, as well as filling in the uh, sidewalk network. Next project there is 41st Ave Pavement Rehab and Multimodal Improvements. This repaves a portion of 41st Ave. It installs a physical barrier, as noted in the picture there, at the Highway 1 southbound on-ramp, as well as installing audible pedestrian signals, overhead lane selection signage, and roadway markings. And then the final project in this grouping here is the Green Valley Road Rehab Project. 
So this project reconstructs the entire roadway, removes and replaces the existing curb ramps that don't comply with accessibility standards, restripes the roadway to provide striping for bike lanes, and retrofits a signalized intersection and includes a, a high visibility crosswalk. Next slide, please. The next slides, the next grouping of projects here are uh, essentially solely system preservation projects or resurfacing projects. Um, and these are mainly uh, through the county. Um, we have the first group in the projects is the Coralitos Corridor resurfacing. It resurfaces 2.4 miles of a messy road and 1.8 miles of Coralitos Road. The next project is the Emergency Routes Program, and that's on Empire Grade and Bear Creek Road. And that resurfaces um, 3.6 miles on Empire Grade and 4.7 miles on Bear Creek. And then we have the Highway 17 Corridors Project. That one resurfaces 5.2 miles on Branson 40 Drive and 4.4, excuse me, 4.5 miles on SoCal San Jose Road. And the recommended funding for this particular project um, is, is a continuation of an existing project uh, that the county has. And so we're recommending to um, add, this, add funding from this project to the existing project. The next project is the Intercounty Routes uh, project. And that one resurfaces 2.7 miles of roadway on all of Murphy's Crossing. I'm saying, I might be saying this name wrong, but Rogi or Rogi Lane and uh, portions of Lee Road and West, uh, West Beach Road in Watsonville. All of these are connector routes leading to the highway and uh, to cross country bridges and receive significant amounts of commute, commercial and agricultural traffic on a daily basis. And we also receive uh, a number of letters of support for this particular project, uh, specifically for Murphy's Crossing for um, from the various ver berry farmers that use that route. And then the final project here we have is the um, Rio Del Mar resurfacing project. And that one provides resurfacing to nearly all of Rio Del Mar, uh, just over a mile. Um, and for these particular projects, our advisory committees uh, were asking for the project sponsor to review and, and, and where, where it's feasible and appropriate to incorporate some version of a complete streets element, whether it's a it's, um, shared lane markings on the roadway, it's uh, additional bike safety signage or some kind of components that are included in the county's uh, active transportation plan. Next slide, please. We have two other uh, road serving projects that are not rehab projects. Um, and the first one is at Robertson Street in SoCal Drive. It's an, uh, this one installs a new intersection and it converts the existing um, all-way stop controlled intersection to a signalized intersection. The installation will uh, provide a safer crossing option for pedestrians and less disruptive for traffic. And it includes uh, pedestrian signal crossing, ADA curb ramps, and tra transit signal priority. The next project there is the Bethany Culvert replacement in Santa Cruz. That one replaces a failed bridge, and, or excuse me, a failed culvert and bridge on West Cliffs Drive. The construction results in a larger cross section of the roadway, which will then allow for future uh, multimodal infrastructure improvements. Next slide. So then we have a couple of uh, additional bike, pedestrian, and transit projects. The first one is on Glen Arbor Road in Ben Loman. This one extends the sidewalk uh, along the northern side of Glen Arbor from Highway 9 to Pine Street. The sidewalk provides a gap closure connection for residents and children to access destinations in Ben Loman. The next one is a Green Valley Road multi-use trail. This replaces a dilapidated pedestrian trail with a two mile long pervious two-way multi-use trail between the city of Watsonville and Santa Cruz County un unincorporated. The project also upgrades five Metro bus stops with shelters and one more with an accessible landing and all upgrades include trash receptacles. And then the final project on this slide here is the Felton SLV Complete Streets Project. This project is located on 1.75 miles of Highway 9 in the San Lorenzo Valley. This project aims to improve safety, enhance bicycles and pedestrian access and connectivity, reduce speeding and address geographic inequities by rectifying underinvestment in rural regions. Uh, the project includes dedicated bicycle facilities, expanded pedestrian facilities, crossing safety improvements, and in improved transit stop access and amenities. Next slide. Then we have uh, funding as well, recommended funding for two additional programs. These are bike and safety pedestrian programs. The first one is the Go Santa Cruz County Bicycle Incentives Program. This provides um, rebates and or discounts, discounted annual membership to the bike share program or rebates for uh, low-income individuals to purchase a regular bicycle or an electric bicycle. 
The next program there is the Ecology Actions Youth Safe Routes to Schools program. And this program provides hands-on school-based bicycle and pedestrian safety education for youth through the Walk Safe and Bike Safe programs. This program provides second graders pedestrian safety training and fifth graders with bicycle safety training throughout the county. Next slide. And these are the, the final sets of projects here that I'm providing a background on. And these are transit projects that are recommended for funding specifically with the SB 125 uh, pot of funds. And so the first project is the zero emission, zero emission passenger rail and trail project. This project is requesting funds for the project development of the new high capacity zero emission passenger rail service and stations on approximately 22 miles of the Santa Cruz branch line. Uh, for this recommendation, uh, staff is recommending partial award of 2 million. Um, and with this staff plan to apply to the state rail assistance program for competitive funds in 2024 to complete the project's environmental documents with the 2 million in SB 125 and measure D both serving as matching funds. The next project is the rapid corridors project. This project aims to improve transit service and safety by implementing transit priority infrastructure on routes 71, 69A, 69W, and 91X corridors. And this includes improvements such as bus bulbs, bulb belts, excuse me, in-lane bus stops, separated bikeways, new bus shelters with real-time passenger information, and secure bike parking. The recommended funding for this particular project is $4 million, and uh, this funding will help implement the transit signal preemption portion of the project, which would make uh, the reimagined Metro service more successful. The remainder of Santa Cruz uh, Metro's Rapid Corridors project can also be included in the RTC's SB1 Cycle 4 application that we'll be submitting to the CTC. And lastly, the, the last project on there to receive the majority of the SB 125 funding is Metro's transit operations for uh, reimagined Metro. The funding will support the implementation of the both recovery and expansion plan in two phases. First, restoring service, and second, expanding service. The phase one represents a 16% increase in service relative to today and a restoration to pre-COVID levels. And then phase two will increase service 43% relative today. Uh, and this funding will support nearly, be, or excuse me, between two and three years of service. Next slide, please. Okay, so recommended funding by mode. Um, out of the 26 million in RTC discretionary funds, nearly half or 47% is recommended for pavement preservation types of projects, while a third or 33% is proposed for bike and pedestrian improvements. Transit projects receive a significant, or significantly smaller share, only 6% in the discretionary pot. However, when factoring in all funding sources, the picture changes dramatically. Transit projects are prioritized in our overall plan, and over 57% of the total recommendation to distribute um, 61 million in available funds. Next slide. So let's see. So this is based on, so this um, is a funding distribution chart based on um, funds for the discretionary funds by the projects part, by the project partners. So like I mentioned previously, Santa Cruz Metro is recommended to receive the vast majority of the available SV-125 funds um, and nearly 94% of that pot. Meanwhile, the RTC discretionary funds are recommended to be distributed as follows. So for county projects, uh, we're recommending 14 million go, to the, go towards the county, which is representing about 53% of the discretionary pot. The city of Santa Cruz projects are taking roughly 6 million, are recommending 6 million of the pot for their projects, and that represents roughly 21% of the discretionary pot. And then the remaining funds are divided amongst the other project sponsors. Next slide. Okay. So what happens next? So we're here today at the, the public hearing. We'll hear input from the um, from members of the public and get additional feedback from the, the board and, project, and potentially project sponsors. And then we will um, make a final award decision and we'll take that award decision then next and we'll submit uh, projects that are recommended for STIP funding to the CTC or the California Transportation Commission um, by December 15th. And then projects that are receiving SB 125 funding will then, um, will then be um, recommended and are included in our packet that's due to the California Strait, excuse me, the California State Transportation Agency or CALSTA by December 31st. 
So that concludes my presentation. You said you can go to the next slide, please. And I just have the, the final list of staff recommendations for your for your approval today. So one is to hold continue holding the public hearing, consider recommendations both from project sponsors, the public and and people in the room today. Um, and then finally adopt a resolution that approves our, our recommendations and moves this process forward. And that is that is my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions. Also noting that project sponsors are in the room to answer any specific questions about a particular project. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ronho. Other comments or questions from commissioners? All right, all right. Well, then we'll uh, take public comment. We'll simply uh, open, uh, Open us up for public comment. If you have a, have a comment, go ahead. Please uh, approach the podium. Uh, Chair Connick, members of the commission, Jim Helmer, Ben Lohman. I first wanted to thank the County of Santa Cruz for a very compelling and complete application for pedestrian safety on uh, Glen Arbor Road walkway project. And I would like to also thank the uh, RTC and all of the technical advisory committees that have put together the recommended funding package. I think it's very balanced and uh, well thought out and interconnected. Um, just a, a couple of comments. Um, in the North County, um, particularly San Lorenzo Valley, it's, it's just revolving highway closures. Highway 236 near Big Basin closed for months. Uh, Highway 9 approaching Saratoga closed for months and just this week announced four more full, full closures. Bear Creek Road closed for months up on actually State Highway 35, I think it is. It's not Bear Creek Road. Bottom line is all of that traffic is redirected back through Boulder Creek, Ben Lomond, and Felton. And when you actually close Highway 9 near Highlands for four months, J slide for months, multiple lane closures, et cetera, um, for utility and tree work, Glen Arbor Road is the de facto Highway 9. And um, I would just like to say that not only is it important, but the two block stretch of Glen Arbor Road uh, on each end of it is a bus stop. And the other thing is the SLV residents strongly support system preservation on Bear Creek Road, Empire Road, just as you did last year on the emergency response routes of Alba Road and Jamison Creek. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Helmer. Good morning, Chair, Commissioners, Claire Gologli with the City of Santa Cruz. I wanted to commend the RTC staff on the revised recommendation. I think it does an excellent job taking in the um, comments by your various advisory bodies and by the various community groups, reflecting a real interest in a balanced program of projects that reflects the varied needs in our community. In speaking with my colleagues at other jurisdictions, we in general share this sentiment. We're pleased to see the revised program of projects uh, that's proposed to you today. Within the city, we're really excited to be able to deliver on some big projects that we're, we're looking forward to improving in our community. And I think overall, what you see before you is going to do a great job improving conditions for our traveling public wherever they're trying to go and however they're trying to get there. So thank you very much. You, Ms. Glogley. Jessica Evans um, from the city of Santa Cruz, not representing the city. I just live there. <laughs> um, I, I just wanted to commend staff. I think that staff did a great job of working really hard to come up with um, a recommendation that serves the county really well, um, that is both putting together some important programs that matter for right now and also looking forward and um, making sure that there's local commitments 
that will enable us to continue to improve and grow our transportation system um, going forward. Um, I think it was, you know, it's not always easy. Everybody wants a bite. Everybody wants a piece. Um, but I think that staff really did a good job. And um, I personally just recommend that, you know, you guys just approve it, honestly. <laughs> just, just, you know, push green and move forward. That would be, that's my opinion. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Evans. Good morning, I'm Paula Bradley a Capitola and District 1 resident. I support option C. I prefer funding for complete streets projects and that the 8.5 million go for zero emission passenger rail and trail. So funds are available to continue with the approved project work plan. Agreed it is critical that we have an improved Metro transit system. Our roads suffer from underfunded maintenance and storm damage. The only way to increase bicycling and walking is to invest in making it safer as part of a multimodal transportation system. Last month at the RTC committees, 8.5 million was recommended for the transit and inner city rail capital program. Now option B. Today staff recommends option A with only 2 million for rail to leverage more funds. With options B and C, transit would have gotten 75% of the SB 125 funds, rail 25%. Now with option A, transit gets 94%. The staff report discusses applying for uncertain funding <clears throat> for zero emissions rail and trail to recover the funds needed to continue the work plan. Then there's an option D with no funds for rail, which is much worse than 2 million, zero. 74% of county voters clearly stated we want rail and trail. I'm concerned about transparency, making decisions contrary to proceeding with the rail and trail plan and maintaining trust among the competing transportation interest groups and the public so that we can continue to work together in good faith. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bradley. Good morning, commissioners, alternates, and staff. My name is Saladin Sale. I live in Santa Cruz. In recognition of the season, I just wanted to thank you all for the selfless service and professionalism that you've displayed all year long on our collective behalf. We are honored to have you. I want to express my support for the staff recommendation of $2 million for zero emission passenger rail and trail. Although I support the staff recommendation, I sorely wish it could be closer to the 16.5 million requested as zero emission passenger rail and trail is by far the most significant and consequential investment in the transportation future of our county we can make. I find Metro's 15 minute fare free wave service to be very exciting. A three year fare free high frequency bus is a bold experiment in supporting public behavioral change for a better future. And finally, given ongoing calls for continued expansion of existing automobile support infrastructure and the diversion of long-term investments in clean and scalable transportation into no progress basic maintenance functions like repaving, I urge the commission to remain mindful of the public's overwhelming support for zero emission passenger rail and adjacent trail as the spine of our county's transit system. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sale. Good morning, Chair Koenig and commissioners. Uh, I'm Matt Farrell. I'm the board chair of Friends of the Rail and Trail. And I just want to, uh, we submitted a letter in support of the revised staff recommendation 
I just want to make a few short points. First of all, I want to say that in the world of transportation, we are in a changed universe because for the first time in years, the leader of the Regional Transportation Committee at Commission and the Transit District and rail advocates are all talking to each other. And that is a huge change in the tone of the conversation. And I want to change those, thank those people for taking that step to engage in that open and free discussion, because that's how we will get change. Finally, I want to say that the TERSIP program is identified to fund both rail and transit. Those are its highest priorities. And we look forward to working in the coming months and years with the transit district to come up with a collaborative solution to realize the opportunity of rail. So we are strongly in support of the revised recommendation and we appreciate all the work the RTC staff did in the application for the rail project. It was a very professional, well done in application but we are going to stand with the revised staff recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Farrell. Good morning. Uh, my name is Matt Machado. I'm the director of public works for the County of Santa Cruz. And I just want to make three comments and three points. Uh, for starters, uh, we fully support the revised staff recommendation. Uh, and the second point is we want to thank the RTC staff for such a balanced approach, and we know how much work they put into it to get to that balanced approach that, for the most part, we all can support um, wholeheartedly. So thank you for that. And my third point is I'd like to thank Metro for their collaboration and partnership, and especially Michael Tree for his, his leadership and his vision. So thanks to all of the partners here, and uh, hopefully the commission can make this vote easy on themselves. And so I thank you for your continued support as well. Thank you, Director Machado. Hi, everyone. I live in Aptos. Thank you, everyone. Um, and um, please support the staff recommendation to allocate $2 million to SB 125 funds to the rail concept study. This local funding will show the state that Santa Cruz County is committed to the rail project. It will help us compete for the state and federal grant funding the project will need going forward. Friends of the Rail and Trail was part of the effort to get this $34.7 million in flexible one-time public transportation funding for our county. Rail should be included in the allocations. The first two phases of the rail concept study are fully funded. This is important work that will provide a foundation for the environmental impact report and plans. It is critical to have some resources dedicated in the next steps. A strong Metro will build a strong foundation for the passenger rail project as we move forward. Metro is an essential part of our public transportation system. Let's not forget Watsonville. I live down in Aptos. 30% of Watsonville residents do not own a car. 80% of them work at the boardwalk. And um, during the Measure D, the uh, no way green, the Greenway vote, 84% of Watsonville voters rec voted to keep the rail line in force. I also quickly just want to bring up, since we're here in Scotts Valley, there's a public letter that was written a few years ago by the seven San Lorenzo Valley fire officials. They opposed forced abandonment of the Felton branch line, the Santa Cruz branch line, um, and they support Roaring Camp. They needed to keep that freight line open. So, because it, Thank you, Ms. Andriata. Hi, uh, my name is Joan. I'm a Santa Cruz resident. Um, and I have been uh, traveling in Europe for the last six weeks, um, totally dependent on rail and bus. Um, 
And I am so delighted to hear that uh, Metro is wants to implement a, um, a world-class bus system in Santa Cruz. I think it's also important that we try to implement a world-class uh, rail system in Santa Cruz. And I think you are right about changing the culture of people taking public transportation. It is cost effective, it is um, energy effective, it is a wonderful way to travel. Um, my daughter lives in Spain. They are one person, uh, one household car, uh, uh, how, one car household. Um, and um, I find that uh, the traffic is minimal. The um, there are, Every place that I was in Switzerland and Italy, uh, there was a designated um, trail, biking trail, right next to the train. And it was utilized. Some of these trains actually have playgrounds on them. It is just phenomenal. Um, and so I think that of uh, that 34.7 million, I would like to see more allocated to uh, uh, rail trail moving forward, but um, certainly I um, support the staff recommendation of $2 million for rail trail to continue the studies. Thank you. Thank you, John. See no one else here in chambers. Is there anyone online? All right, I see we have some folks. We'll begin with Brian Peoples. Hi, this is Brian from Trail Now. Um, let's be realistic. Southern California is moving their existing rail inlanders. By 2035, their goal is to do that. Our rail corridor goes 20 feet from the Pacific Ocean. Trying to put a train there violates the Coastal Commission sea level rising requirements. So it's essentially we're investing millions on more design of a train that you can't have. It's like somebody building a house and they're gonna say they're gonna build this huge house, but the zoning, it doesn't meet the requirements. So obviously we oppose giving more, wasting more tax dollars on a train that will never arrive. Secondly, we want to prioritize opening the coastal corridor. As we're seeing, our roads are very dangerous. We need an alternative route. That coastal corridor needs to be opened. And that process is rail banking. That process was recommended by the expert, former RTC executive director, Guy Preston, who came forward years ago, recommending that you rail bank it like all other communities across the country. And the rail banking process, what it does is it preserves the corridor for future transportation as a future transportation corridor. It doesn't mean that you can't have a, um, a transit system in the future. So it's very unacceptable uh, that we put Roaring Camp over our community and stopping us from opening the corridor. We wish that you would put more of a focus on rail banking and opening the Santa Cruz Coastal Trail as soon as possible, all the way to Watsonville. The only way you're going to get it to Watsonville is through rail making. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Peebles. Ms. Faulkner. Thank you, commissioners and staff. Our county is faced with serious transportation challenges. Our roads are crumbling. Our highway is traffic bound weekdays and weekends. And our surface streets are clogged with aggressive drivers where our kids, and seniors no longer feel safe to walk or bike in our community without fear of losing their lives. In December of 2021, after months of collaboration between numerous commissions, funds proposed to go to Metro were taken away at the initiative of the current chair. And in the past three years, the traffic and safety problems on our surface streets have gotten worse, not better. How can we spend our money on transportation in a way that would address equity, our environmental crisis, traffic and facilitate social connection and generate money for our community. The staff's plan helps to address this. When it comes to dollars and cents, public transit investments create huge positive economic ripple effects. The American Public Transportation Association estimates that for every dollar we invest into our public transportation systems, 
we generate $5 back into our community. Prioritizing public transit and facilitating more bus ridership means more jobs and increased economic vibrancy, which results in more money for our community. Metro has been successfully building a world-class busing system for our community with 15-minute headways on major routes from north to south county. Reimagine Metro will provide a clean alternative to driving that provides truly equitable access to jobs, parks, schools, while reducing traffic. Equity Transit supports the staff recommendation, prioritizing Metro's world-class bus system with a small amount of funding for rail to be used as leverage to seek further funding and support for our community's majority vote on Proposition 116 and Measure D 2022. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Faulkner. David Van Brink. Uh, good morning, good morning. Uh, can you hear me okay? We can. Hey, apologies for uh, dialing in. I'm uh, David Van Brink. I live in the city of Santa Cruz. I'm calling in to support the staff recommendation. Everything is trade-offs. Uh, and of course, I'm relieved that rail planning continues forward. Uh, as a resident on the west side, of course, I'm biased, but the new service levels of Metro are fantastic. The stop at my end of my at the end of my block, uh, what is it, a Flower and Western, has a red level service. And, and it's great. I use it multiple times per week. You know, like many of you, I'm basically the opposite of a captive writer. I just prefer to use public transit when it's available and possible. And on, on this block, at least it is. Um, so yes, support the staff recommendation. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Van Brink. Mina Cole. Now. Ms. Cole, are you there? It seems that you're unmuted, but we can't hear you. All right, well, let's proceed with the next commenter, Mr. Cannon. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Piet Cannon with Ecology Action. Um, I want to thank the commission for its support of our youth bike safety and walk safety programs that we provide to elementary students throughout the county. It's a crucial program in terms of supporting active transportation. And I also, um, you know, encourage the commission to support um, full funding for this program as the staff has recommended. And then I also wanted to talk to the RTC's program for e-bike incentive programs. I think um, providing um, a financial incentive to purchase an electric bike is a big step in expanding sustainable transportation that is affordable. There is an e-bike revolution where a more wider group of people can now go further and faster on a bicycle with electric bikes. And so reducing the, the ownership cost barriers is a big step in terms of making that form of new sustainable transportation available to folks throughout the county. And especially with a focus on higher financial incentive amounts for those who qualify um, in terms mm -hmm. of being low income. So fully promote that program. And then also embedded in that program is a funding for low income um, reduced fares for e-bike share programs. The B-Cycle program has started in the city of Santa Cruz and UCSC and have been wildly successful. And um, that program will expand out through the county. And it would be great when it rolls out, there is an option for income qualified folks to be able to access that program at a very reduced price. I think UCSC students pay $12 a year for membership for you know that, that whole 12 month use. So if, if, there, if the rates can be as low or in that category for qualified county residents, that would make a big difference because um, e-bike share program is like a public transit program. So thank you very much. Appreciate that. Shannon, John. Here's your unmuted, John, so go ahead. Oh, all right. Um, Mr. Nelson. 
Yes, this is Jack Nelson of Santa Cruz. And so to, I'm seeing today is a big day for Santa Cruz Metro. I really support uh, the growth of that system. Uh, I also support uh, including the uh, at least two million dollars for the rail for the rail trail study, and so I'm I'm left wondering how bicycles are doing in the, in this uh, program. And I'd like to call your attention to your agenda packet, where attachment three or four uh, comments received has a letter from the RTC's own bicycle advisory committee, and uh, a key point of their writing is asking you to really work with all these project sponsors uh, to include complete streets uh, in in various uh, street and road projects. Com complete streets, of course, includes making streets more usable and friendly and safe for bicycles, with the ultimate really being uh, uh, barriers or separate pathways for bicycles. Uh, I just want to say uh, bicycling really is a practical transportation means. For instance, living here on the east side of Santa Cruz, uh, with the last class I took at Cabrillo College, I rode my bike out to Cabrillo College and back and found as a senior it was really vitalizing for my health and it was reliable as to timing. My class started at 6 p.m. and so I couldn't count on what was happening on the bus on Highway 1, but I could count on my own bicycle to get me there and get me home. It worked really well. And it was truly zero emissions. So uh, as this um, as this uh, goes forward, I hope you're approving it. I hope your staff will be looking at those comments from the Bicycle Advisory Committee. And uh, member Rick Hyman has given you very detailed uh, project by project uh, comments on that. Thank you. Mr. Nelson. All right, Sean, we'll Give one more chance here. Have your comment. Go ahead. John, can you hear us? So there you go. Uh, from uh, Metro's comments today, they're going forward with their work uh, and their planning, um, assuming, you know, with the intention of working with. Uh, working with rail. Uh, the down the the downtown uh, specific plan for Watsonville, they're also doing the same thing, including with uh, housing near the uh, uh, housing and shops near the station. You don't have to take any comments from anybody in that room to know that um, rail is important and we want it funded. It has been well funded. How through negotiations, it went from 8.5 million to 2 million, uh, no, 8.5 million to zero, and then to 2 million in just a couple of days. I'd like to hear about that. Why is the RTC trying to defund its own project? Transportation Cafe uh, number nine, an RTC production uh, on their YouTube channel. We're very excited to uh, uh, to to roll out plans for uh, uh, for rail and trail. Uh, they had S Sandy Lydon on, um, so anybody can go and find that. And um, your own data on the uh, the uh, the Vision Santa Cruz County uh, uh, website tells you that there are more people with disabilities living in the zip codes through which. Uh, the rail corridor runs than mo than almost all of the rest of the county, and that number is rising. Rail is not a uh, uh, you know it's not a liability, you know it's a uh, uh, you know it, it's a it's a positive. It's going to be a draw for people uh, you know with pop property nearby. Thank you, Sean. Gina Galina Cole, we'll give you one more shot here. You're unmuted. Go ahead. Ms. Cole, are you there? All right. We still cannot hear you, so we're going to move on. All right.
right, that's the end of uh, commenters online. I'll return to the commission for a uh, motion and I'll, uh, Mr. Montesino. Yeah, I'd like to move staff recommendation to in the community moving forward. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Commissioner Montesino, a second by Vice Chair Brown. Any further discussion? Commissioner Schifrin? Um, what we've talked about this morning, what we've heard about is need for balanced system. And I think that's really important. I think what the question is and the concern that I have is what's the appropriate balance? And I think we have a recommendation that um, in terms of road funding, that funding should go, that could go for roads, is going to go for roads. I think that is appropriate. But the question is, what about the rail and uh, bus funding, the, the transit funding? Is it um, the appropriate balance to have $2 million towards rail? And I think it's either 26 or 28 or 30. I'm going to ask staff what it was, but it's about $28 million that is being proposed for the transit district. And, you know, I think it's, you know, the as we heard from the last presentation, what the transit district wants to do is extremely desirable. It will make for a, a much, much better uh, bus system. And I'm very supportive of it. My concern is, though, that it's a three-year program. And... It can get started with a little bit less money in the first year, as far as I'm concerned. And so I want to talk a little bit about what are the consequences of the staff recommendation in terms of the continuing with the rail feasibility study. As I understand it, and I'm sure staff, if somebody, if not somebody else, will correct me, the next phase, with the current phase of feasibility, we have the funding for that. That's going to take maybe 18 months to complete. The next phase, which is the EIR, may cost, or the final phases, may cost as much as $26 million. We're hoping that we'll get a grant for that. With the $2 million, maybe we'll only need $24 million. The grant won't be for 100%, and that's really what my concern is, because we'll have to come up with 20%. The only place we can come up with that 20% is Measure D. And Measure D funding is quite limited it, for rail. Um, much of it is going towards maintenance, which we know is a never-ending problem. Um, but some of it is going for this rail study. To the extent that we're able to put aside some of this money that's available to us now, this $30 million or whatever it is for the rail study, that's less measured D money that we're going to need down the road. And that's going to make a big difference in terms of one, whether we're ever one going to be able to complete that study. And two, if the study turns out to show that rail is feasible, um, whether that is going to be possible to use some of that money for the construction of passenger rail service. Passenger rail, as others have said, is going to be an incredible boost, or significant boost at least. I don't want too much hyperbole here. A significant boost to tra public transit in Canada, especially between Watsonville and Canada, city of the whole corridor. Being able to uh, afford to provide that service, if it turns out to be feasible, and having the funding to allow it to be feasible is, I think, really important. So it's a question of what's the appropriate balance here. Uh, my, I originally, I supported, as did ITAC at their meeting, the original staff recommendation, which was to give $8.5 million to the um, rail study and the rest of it to the metro. And I think that that would really make a significant difference in terms of, one, our ability to get the state the state grant to do the next phase, and two, the, the, the uh, impact that having to provide the local share will have on the Measure D rail fund. I've been convinced from the presentation by 
Metro, Metro do manager, that it, you know, there is a need over the three years to have this $32 million. And supportive of that. My sense, though, is that um, that's going to take time to get going. There could be other funding sources over the next couple of years. And this is a chance, this is a, a source of funding that comes along only irregularly. So what, I'm, what I would propose as a compromise is that the allocation to, for the rail study go from $2 million to $4.25 million so that it would represent <clears throat> half of what was the original staff recommendation. There would still be well over $20 million for the Metro pilot pro three-year pilot project. So I'm gonna, uh, I would like to amend, make a motion to amend the motion on the floor to approve the staff recommendation with the increase in the funding for rail from $2 million to $4.5 million. But I, uh, and I would say negative because, you know, as you stated, in 1978, we had a golden opportunity. And, and then in Measure D, we had a golden opportunity. Now we have a transformative opportunity to transform our community. And by a planning document, like you said, we have other avenues. You said Metro has other avenues. Brown Trail has other avenues. We can, you know, but it's a planning document. This is food on the ground. This is for our community. This is transformative. The first time in, since 78 that we're actually going to put so much service, so much emphasis in, in, in providing a world cast system. So um, not... Well, so I mean, it's, no. it's not considered a friendly <laughs> amendment. Uh, I think... Uh, are you proposing a substitute motion, Commissioner Schifrin? I guess I'll make it as a substitute motion. Okay. Is there a second? I'll second. Uh, I'd like to see where um, others are at here. All right. I would like to respond to Commissioner Montesino's response, my motion. Um, there's right. no question that the Metro proposal is worth funding. And it's going to move forward, mm -hmm. it's a three-year program. There are, as we've seen over the years, the funding available for Metro comes in many different forms, from the state government to the federal government. And one of the you know, creative ways that Metro has been able to get funding is the free fare program, which I think is a very desirable pilot as well. And you know, it's, Metro has opportunities. In fact, there is very little funding available for rail. It gets 8% of the Measure D money. Metro gets 16%. Metro D, uh, the Metro is getting $31.4 million a year in just local funding, sales tax, the Measure D funding, and the vast majority of the TDA money. All is going to Metro. And I've always supported that. I just think that this is a time when, if we're going to be serious about rail, and I know you, as well as the other South County representatives, have been very supportive of moving forward with rail. It's going to make a difference in terms of how much this commission shows its commitment to really wanting to take rail seriously by putting some of the money that it could allocate into the rail study. And uh, going from $2 million out of what was originally an $8 million, $8.5 million uh, recommendation is not a huge uh, commitment. I think $4.25 million is a much fairer commitment. That's why um, um, I offered this substitute. Thank you, Commissioner Schifrin. Mr. Johnson. Sorry, Johnson. Uh, yeah, yeah, sorry, did you have some I, I would just like to make one clarification, Mr. Chair. Um, the um, zero emission passenger rail project, the total cost for doing the Full environmental document is $26 million. That does include uh, the concept report, which the commission has already funded uh, of the commission. And 
with Measure D money plus grant funds that the RTC secured from TERSIP, the total of 9.23 million. So that does leave uh, about $16.8 million uh, for the, that are needed for that project to have complete funding. And I know there's a lot of numbers that are out there, so it's easy to get confused. Thank you for that clarification, Director. Commissioner Kalantar Johnson. Thank you. Yeah, Commissioner Brown said she wanted to see where um, commissioners were at. I'm not in support of this alternate motion. I'm in support of the original motion made, the staff recommendation. Um, we have a really unique opportunity before us right now. Um, we heard from Metro workers here. We heard from the public. And um, we've got boots on the ground, literally. We're ready to go. And without the $28 million, we won't be. Um, this is not a moment for us to pit rail against uh, buses. We need each other. Neither modes of transportation will be successful either now or in the future if we don't truly collaborate. Um, and I do believe the staff recommendation and where we have landed um, with the staff recommendation is true collaboration and gives momentum both for us to, for the Metro to move forward with what's in the works, ready to go in a couple of weeks with phase one and spring, summer with phase two, um, and continue to support <coughs> rail, which we know from the last election, um, our community wants to see. I have, a, I'm committed to that as a, a Metro board member to see both modes of transportation. So that's where I'm at. Thank you, Commissioner Lantara Johnson. Commissioner McPherson. Then yeah, thank you. Um, and I will be against the substitute motion and go support the initial motion. Um, I have a extended uh, comment that I'd like to, it's adjusted now, but uh, first I wanna thank the RTC for the recommendations on the roads, uh, especially in my district and the fifth district on uh, Glen Arbor Road, the Svelton Center and Valley School Complex and the Empire Grade. Um, Mare Creek Road, as and as a board uh, metro board member, I'm enthusiastic about the reimagined uh, metro funding that we've looked, we've heard about, and I look forward to the results of that in the pilot program. And as a county supervisor, I'm uh, equally gratified for, for the funding to repair the roads. Uh, we don't have the roads in, in order. Nothing else travels very well uh, at all. So uh, that's first things first. I think it's important to, I just saw a recent, study uh, results from the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Uh, they they, uh, they uh, categorized, there's 3,143 counties in the United States, and they had a national landslide risk component of that. And unfortunately, we were number 15 in Santa Cruz County. Being high on that list is not a good thing. Uh, we need to pay attention to the road system that we have so everybody of every mode of transportation can take su uh, uh, support for that. And I do support the recommendation to set aside the $2 million for passenger rail. But I wish to share my thoughts regarding that project itself. I've, I've supported funding for all of the rail exploratory studies, and there's been many of them in reports because I have always believed that we need to preserve the option passenger rail. Uh, it's just good public policy that we have. But I want to remind everyone that the RTC has a plan in place regarding passenger rail. Um, I fully support the concept report investment because we need to have the full facts regarding the feasibility to build and operate the passenger rail. And up to this point, I've, both sides of this discussion have argued the facts, if they will, their own facts regarding rail ridership, cost, potential, uh, and to pull traffic off of Highway 1 and so on. But the only numbers we have now is that it says that it will cost $1.2 billion with a B, but likely that number will be much more in the future. Many rail proponents have indicated to my office that they do not care what the cost will be. It matters if we can realistically fund it. But we do not have the luxury of not caring about the cost of projects, and each project we fund really must have a cost-benefit ratio analysis to it that shows how it should be prioritized. The concept report will illuminate the reality of the situation so the commission can make an evidence-based decision regarding any next steps in pursuing passenger rail. I will not be in the seat when that decision is made, and 
I can hear the size of relief already. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> so I want to encourage all of you to analyze the concept report and make the best decision for our community within the context of all the other critical transportation needs that have been identified today. And lastly, it goes without saying, whenever I talk about transportation in Santa Cruz County, I want to thank the voters of Santa Cruz County, more than two thirds of them who, who supported Measure D that said, yes, we have an issue here and we want to try, uh, we have a problem here and we want to try to correct it and improve it to the best of our ability. There was very se various segments of that percentages that have been mentioned. And each of those people that uh, you could be rail, you could be bike, you could be a, a bus, you could be uh, you could be a, a vehicle. Uh, they all say it wouldn't have passed without me, and you're right, it wouldn't have it needed two thirds. And so it's a comprehensive measure that was passed that we have to address with the limited funds we have. I think this report we have and this suggestion hmm. we have is the best way we can address the transportation needs of Santa Cruz County today. Thank you, Commissioner McPherson. Commissioner Vice Chair Brown. Um, this is a really exciting day, in my opinion. There's a lot of really great projects that are for us today that are going either fully or partially funded. When we're looking at the uh, road repair and improvements, the bicycle and pedestrian projects, uh, the projects that address equity and accessibility, these are just really exciting. And the fact that we're here to support these projects today, I think, needs to be acknowledged. Uh, in addition to that, the opportunity to move forward with Metro's uh, Reimagine Metro program and the comments that I made earlier about what this means, not just in transportation, but for housing. Uh, and again, equity here in our county, this is all really exciting. Um, ad additionally, you know, the idea that we are bringing forward an additional $2 million to use for uh, serving as a match for additional funding for uh, the zero emission passenger rail and trail project. What I see today is that we heard from interests within the city, we've heard with, from interests within the county and county staff, we've heard from Metro, we've heard from Fort, we've heard from Ecology Action and their uh, pedestrian and, and bike education program and RTC staff. And so that is almost every single interest within the transit and transportation community within our county has stepped forward to speak uh, on favor in favor of the staff recommendation. And to me, that is the best example of what it looks like to convene, collaborate, and build consensus to build good public policy. Um, and that is, is what really excites me. That is what I really care about, is building um, consensus in order to develop public policy to serve the interests of our community um, in a wide variety of ways. And so that's why I have seconded uh, the motion for the approval of the staff recommendation and not uh, support the substitute. Thank you, Vice Chair Brown. We had Commissioner Sandy Brown next and Commissioner Hernandez. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I wanna just make a couple of comments uh, about the decision that is before us and um, kind of my rationale for seconding uh, Commissioner Schifrin's motion. So, and, and ask a couple of questions as well, um, because I think it's important that the community understand um, you know, we are in, it's it's an exciting day. It's a wonderful day. I absolutely support the Metro vision and I want uh, us to move forward um, with providing the resources necessary um, for, to, to test this out, to, to get moving and, and see, um, you know, see what happens. And, and I do think that it's gonna contribute to a robust transit network um, and, and probably will in the long-term um, help us get rail funding. Um, so yes, it's an exciting day and uh, really wonderful things are happening. It's also a really a no-win situation for decision makers when there are so many uh, projects that we know are critical. I mean, I, I have in my head and I'm not gonna um, give a speech about it, but you know, I've talked with uh, folks from County Roads, you know, Mr. Wiesner, you're here and you have explained very clearly, um, you know, what the challenges are for our, our county system. And I've also heard those numbers, what happens when we don't do those repairs and there are failures. And um, so so I understand that that need is so critical and, um, and we don't have enough funding for it. 
the city pro projects are, you know, obviously as a city of Santa Cruz representative to the Metro or to the RTC, excuse me, I, um, you know, I see the, those projects. I mean, I know our staff has been working, uh, you know, in, incredibly hard and, and effectively and strategically to prioritize projects and to make them um, the best projects we can, you know, we can get the complete streets um, uh, elements so critical. And, um, and I could go on. And um, and I won't. <laughs> um, but what I want to say about the the rail funding is I recognize that there is a a, a very s s there's an urgency to do it moving forward now with the metro uh, uh, projects, and I'm ab and I 100% support them, and I worry that um, we are going to we're we're going to you know, realize it's, it is a self-fulfilling prophecy <laughs> for, um, you know, those who are, are uh, have been skeptical of rail and the potential for rail. And we have been, I mean, I'm going to be real candid here. We have been fighting it out on this body in the public. And I have time after time seen uh, commissioners uh, do everything they can to uh, undermine rail. And I'm, I worry about that. And I don't want this decision to be one more contribution to that undermining. So uh, I'm, I'm very concerned about that. And so I, um, I guess I'll, and I don't want this to be, I mean, it is zero sum today and it doesn't need to be zero sum in overall. And so I just wanted to ask um, the, our RTC staff about the, um, you know, just to, to provide a reminder here for us about the timing on the when you anticipate completion of the concept report, when we are really going to need that, uh, I think it's approximately 16 million for the environmental review. Um, the staff report has some information about that, and so I'm not asking for um, you know just a, a repeat of that, but but if just a little bit more detail on the, the timing and what funding will be available to kind of move us. Mm -hmm potentially available to us uh, to, to move us towards getting that fully funded when it at the time that it's needed rather than um, then having to take another couple of years and potentially have changes on the commission and you know the political wind shift you know I, I just worry that it is we're in such a tenuous position um, related to moving forward on rail and we have so much support I don't want that window of opportunity to close so um, I see Ms. Christensen is here. If you could just thank talk you. About that. Can you hear me? Thanks. All right. I'm Sarah Christensen of your staff, and I oversee capital delivery for the RTC. And um, I just wanted to give a little bit of a breakdown of the current funding plan for the rail project, um, which is funded currently by a little bit of Measure D rail funds, um, as well as TERSIP competitive funds. Um, and we do have a deficit to complete environmental, obviously, um, the 16 million or so. Um, so our, um, it's really difficult to um, balance all of the needs of the county because everybody needs funding for all of their important work that they're doing. This process happens every two years. So, um, you know, obviously, after today, regardless of what scenario is adopted, we're still going to be pursuing funding to fully fund the environmental process of the rail project. So there's outside funding opportunities. Um, there's the State Rail Assistance Emerging Corridors Program. Um, whatever w the project does not get funded today, we're going to turn around and apply for those funds, whatever the deficit is. If we get, you know, say that's 10 million and we only get 5 million, then we're going to keep looking for that extra $5 million. And this process is going to happen over the next few years. And um, Measure D is available. Whatever is left at the end um, will be funded by Measure D. However, um, the Measure D rail pot of funds uh, is very limited. And um, if we completely empty out our pockets, uh, we could have challenges with cash flow for all of the infrastructure preservation needs along the 32 mile um, rail line. Uh, and so we have to be cognizant of that. And we're also still pending uh, reimbursement by FEMA
for the 2017 storms as well as the 2023 storms. So whatever we don't get reimbursed, we have to manage our uh, funding accordingly and be responsible and it likely is gonna come out of Measure D. But it, you know, it's likely we'll be back in two years for this process to pursue additional funding for environmental. So I just wanted to provide that perspective um, and we appreciate all of the partners that staff's been working with to um, strike a balance and come up with a recommendation that hopefully makes everybody happy and makes your jobs easier. Thank you. Can I just um, follow up with a quick question? I, I'm just wondering, um, so, you, so am I hearing, because I, I didn't hear you say it explicitly, we will, you're anticipating that the RTC would initiate environmental review about two years from now based on the flow of work with the concept report, or that's when you expect funding to again be available? I just want to clarify. The project schedule is about 18 months currently for the concept report that could get pushed out depending on decisions and how things go. but. Um, the timing would be ripe for, you know, this process two years from now. Um, and we could, you know, other strategies we could use is um, inter-program loans and or financing of Measure D, and that was outlined in the staff report as well. Um, if we don't have sufficient cash flow to do the environmental within the schedule that we want to do. One more follow-up question sure. based on what you just said. Um, Th those um, interfund loans would require commission approval, correct? I believe the commission has already approved um, interprogram loans uh, to manage cash flow around Measure D as it relates to uh, the rail project and the FEMA and all of that. So, and that's that's correct. Yeah, the, the commission did approve by by resolution that the interprogram loans could be used to make sure that we manage the cash flow for the concept report. Uh, uh, as needed. Thank you. Can I ask a follow up? Uh, uh, I, I actually had Commissioner. Yeah, I haven't even said that. Fernand Fernandez, then Commissioner Quinn, uh, and then Commissioner Shepard. Uh, I'm going to support the uh, motion as originally. Could, could you lean forward into the microphone a little bit more? I'll do it again. I'm going to support the original motion. And I want to follow up on something Commissioner McPherson said. As commissioners, we owe it to the public to be data driven. And one of the things that impressed me with Mr. Tree's presentation today, he's committed to certain things. 15 minute turnaround, six to eight million riders. So we have to write that down and hold him accountable. <laughs> and what, how we move from here will hinge largely on how you and your impressive team perform on these metrics. And I, I get worried when I'm called train or bus or whatever, I'm neither, I'm data driven. When I hear the train's gonna provide tremendous transportation, I kind of ask myself, what data do we have in hand? The data we have in hand says about a two to 3% reduction in highway one traffic. So if we're gonna commission studies, we need to read them, we need to honor the data, and we need to act accordingly. And so therefore I'm gonna support the initial motion, probably won't be here in three years, but you bet I'll be checking on the 15 minute times. <laughs> Mr. Hernandez. You know, this is a, Interesting day, but you know, I have to start off with, you know, I, I am a rail, uh, a staunch rail supporter. And, you know, I have to, I have to say that we, you know, I talked to staff and I'm glad that we, we talked and we still have just under two years to seek rail funding. And I think this 2.1 million seed money is good for matching grants. We could talk, we could seek the grants that, that their staff was talking about. I feel that we put uh, Metro on the back burner and the idea was for them to find the grants and lo and behold, they found the grants to, to get the vehicles they needed. And I think that we could do the same to find some, some of this funding uh, for, the, for, the, for the rail, um, given that we have two years. Uh, I would wanna seek you know, direction, not here, but later on, that we direct staff to actually seek this funding uh, in the future for rail. You know, and you know what I really wanted to say is I want to thank Luis Mendez and all the RTC staff, you know, for bringing everybody together, right? Uh, from county staff, C county CDI staff, Steve and Matt, you know, M Michael Tree, Met from Metro, the rail folks, uh, Fort folks, 
all the bike advocates and really putting something together, a, a good compromise. You know, when people talk about compromise, it's usually like 51% to 60% of what you want. But here we're talking about, you know, 60 to 90% and everyone's happy, you know. <laughs> In organizing, you always talk about if everybody's unhappy, that's a good compromise. But this is something that we're all happy. So that's an excellent compromise. Um, you know, I'm happy with, you know, Green Valley Road and Corlitos and uh, the Freedom Project and Murphy, Rogie and Lee Road. Uh, I'm happy throughout the county that we're getting the bike and pedestrian programming, uh, all the projects in North County that were affected from damage from fire and flood, all the active transportation projects, the bike and, bike and pedestrian infrastructure is going along with all the projects that we're getting throughout the county. And of course, you know, the, the rail projects that we're getting, you know, from especially the Metro uh, Rapid Corridor project, the reimagined uh, Metro, the rail, the zero emission rail trail funding that we're getting. It's an excellent compromise. And so I'm going to vote for the original, the staff recommendation. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Hernandez. Mr. Schiffer, did you have one more thing to add? Well, I was going to ask uh, Sarah a couple of questions about the impact of um, the the amount of money that's being allocated to the rail study. As I'm understanding it, and you can correct me, that the uh, the remaining money that would be needed to complete the process is $16 million. Is the $2 million going to be reducing that to $14 million? Yes, yeah, so it would. With the original recommendation, it would be reduced to about $8 million. Um, with the motion, the substitute motion, it would be reduced to like $12 million. I understand what you're, if I understood what you were saying, staff is going to be looking for state grants to fill the gap, whatever that gap is, uh, whether it's $14 million, $8 million, $12 million. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Is it also correct that the that whatever grant is received from the state will have a 20% match? Not necessarily. So the, the funding sources we are pursuing do not have the guidelines out, and the guidelines for the program tell you what's required. So if it's 20%, or 50% or zero, we don't know yet. We also don't know the total amount that's available statewide. It's gonna be competitive, um, but typically what we find is the more investment that the locals are willing to make upfront, um, the more commitment you have going into a grant, You know, a higher percentage match is obviously gonna be more competitive than a lower percentage match. So what, whatever it is, I think normally we're thinking that a minimum is 20%. Um, that's that, a wise assumption to make, yes. What? That's wise, a wise assumption, a and minimum that, of 20 That yeah. match is going to come from Measure D. That, is there any other local funding source? Uh, the commission hasn't been very interested in using TDA funding for rail. Um, so... Um, would it be coming from Measure D? It depends on, again, the guidelines because uh, the existing funding that's already been committed could potentially serve also as a match because the full environmental and the concept report is 26 and it's somewhat, the concept report is kind of the beginning of environmental, if you will. We're going to be building off of that for the um what percentage match has Measure D provided for the funding we received so far? <laughs> Let's see. I, I, by my, I, I, I believe that uh, at the moment we have uh, 3.45 million in TERSA funds. Correct. Uh, and the rest of it is in uh, Measure D, correct? So that means that uh, two thirds of the funding the moment is about, about two thirds of Measure D, 60% 60, 60 or two thirds. So what you're saying is that measure D could be 20% of the 16 million overall? Yes, I think we're 
more than 20 percent at this that's point. Yeah, so commissioner Schiffrin, yeah. i am going to cut you off i think that we're counting the votes in this room it does not seem that your substitute motion has the has the votes we're going to call that question in one moment i think we're all getting a little bit a little bit hungry and we do still have a closed session you're welcome to carry on these questions with staff uh in your own private time um, i'd just like to make a few short comments uh first of all um you know i think that we did get through this relatively uh, difficult process fairly conflict free we mentioned don't pit the bus against the train uh, but the reality is all of our projects are pitted against each other all the time unfortunately um, whether it's county roads city roads uh, the bus or the train um, and i think that we've managed to come to a resolution here that is relatively conflict free and that everyone can live with and that is something to be celebrated I also uh, just want to say uh, one quick com one one quick shout out uh, for the light at Robertson Road. Um, this is going to make a big difference on SoCal Drive, and it's going to make a difference not only for cars but also the bus. And I think it's a great demonstration of how improving our road system does also improve our transit network and increase uh, emergency response times. Um, and uh, you know, finally, I'll I, uh, I'll ask a rhetorical question, which is that of course the transit money can be reprogrammed in the future, I believe. If I could just get a nod from staff, I'll take that. Yes, all right. Um, and so, you know, frankly, I would rather see all of the transit money go towards the Metro. We have 30 bus drivers in this room, not 30 train drivers. And so those 2 million, possibly $4 million that was sort of in question here, uh, we, when we fund Reimagine Metro, we're funding it directly into the local economy as soon as possible. Hiring consultants for a train study, that's going to probably go to an out-of-town consultant uh, and leave our community entirely. Moreover, we're talking about moving people uh, within starting next year, not in 2040 or, you know, beyond. So we need to respond immediately to the issues at hand. We need to start building transit ridership, and I think uh, the program we have can do that. You know, again, the transit funds are reprogrammable, so if that concept report comes back lowing and actually demonstrates that rail is better than the bus. I have serious doubts that they will do that. But if it does, uh, we could always look at moving the, the money from, from Metro onto the concept report. And vice versa, I frankly you know, have concerns that we're cutting it a little close with the reimagined Metro project. So if the concept report comes back and shows that rail, uh, unfortunately, is not possible for various reasons, we could always choose to move that concept report money back to reimagined Metro. With that, I'm going to call the question first on the substitute motion as required. Uh, the motion, the substitute motion was uh, to program $4 million for the concept report uh, instead uh, uh, and take $2 million away from Reimagine Metro. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. 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 Any abstentions? Okay, motion fails. I will proceed with the main motion, which is the staff recommendation by Commissioner Montesino and second by Vice Chair Brown. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, motion passed unanimously. Thank you, everyone, for coming today. That brings us to the end of uh, the public hearing, of course, uh, and to the end of the public section of our meeting. County Council, we will now move into closed session. Will there be any reportable actions? Yeah, there may be an actual open uh, session. Sorry. If you guys could, do, excuse me, please just be uh, a little quiet on the way out, and we'll officially close the public session of our meeting. County Council. County Council, do we have, or sorry, uh, RTC Council, do we have any reportable actions coming out of closed session? Um, we may have a reportable action, and there's an additional open session item that the commission may take up after the closed session. Okay, very much. And and the, uh, com the commission will now move into it, closed session. Uh, just one thing, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, it, it is possible if members of the public want to make comments in the closed session, they can do that before you go into closed session. Fair, fair point. Okay, so we will uh, now take comments on the items on our closed session agenda, uh, which are public employment relative to the executive director, uh, the interim executive director, and conference with labor negotiators. Does any uh, member of the public wish to address us on any of those items? Yes. <laughs> Good uh, afternoon, commissioners. Brianna Goodman of your staff and SAIU Union Steward for RTC non-management staff known as CORE. 
Uh, we'd like to thank you today for seeking core staff input on your organizational restructuring. Uh, we appreciate RTC's negotiators are interested in understanding our concerns and representing us faithfully to the board. Thank you for calmly and quietly leaving the, the room. Yes. <laughs> They're excited. Sorry. Um, we look forward to continuing our discussions and working together towards the best outcome for our community. So thank you for hearing us. We appreciate the dialogue. Thank you, Ms. Goodman. Anyone else in chambers that wishes to address us on the closed session items? All right, seeing none, the commission will now move in closed session and we will be back to report on any potential action items. Thank you.